a dank semi-basement apartment. Ki Wu 24 runs from corner to corner searching desperately for a Wi-Fi signal. Various networks pop up but they're all password protected. No. Not you two ip time Ki Yung. Upstairs neighbor finally locked up his Wi-Fi. Lying on the floor of the narrow room Ki Yung 23 barely moves her lips. Fuck. Try 123,456,789 then try it backwards. No luck. Also lying on the floor Chung Suk 49 the mother scoffs at their collective misery. What am I supposed to do if someone calls me? What if it's a job? Hey Ki Tech. She kicks Ki Tech 49 who is sleeping at her feet. I know you're awake asshole. Care to comment? Wiping his drool what? Our phones have been suspended for weeks and now the neighbors have shut us out. What's your plan? She kicks him again. What are you going to do about it? What's the plan genius? She treats Key Tech like shit but it doesn't bother him. He rises with the most serene enlightened smile then plods over to the where he removes a bag of white bread from the sad empty fridge. The bread is nearly gone too. Only the ends remain. Key Tech takes a piece and picks off the moldy parts. He chews on the bread as he watches his son's Wi-Fi dance. Son if one seeks Wi-Fi he raises his hand high. One must reach into the heavens. Up. Yes father. Ki Wu raises the phone high as he heads into the. The bathroom is long and narrow and has a raised altar at the far end where the toilet sits. The odd placement is necessitated by the semi-basement's lower position in relation to the septic tank. Ki Wu walks in and climbs onto the toilet seat. He continues to fish for a signal when. You got it. Ki Yung barges in and walks over with her phone held up. You see it. Coffee Nara 2G. I guess it's a new coffee joint. Must be nearby. I am not getting shit. Get up closer. Ki Yung climbs onto the altar and squeezes next to Ki Wu. The siblings look ridiculous. Head touching the ceiling. Huddled on top of the toilet seat. Chung Sook pops in. No text from pizza time. 2,000 more boxes and it's payday. The family sits among piles of unassembled pizza boxes and folds them in silence. The crunch of cardboard is the only sound as the cheap pizza time logo comes in and goes out of the foreground. They hear a truck rattling closer. Through the window they see a street fumigation truck spewing gas as it passes by. The fog rolls closer to the window. To Ki Wu close the window. Leave it. Free fumigation. Get rid of the damn crickets. Ki Wu who was about to close the window sits back down. The fog quickly envelops the family as they continue to fold. It's rather poignant. A family braving through tear-inducing fumes just to make a meager living. Gasps shit. Coughing I told you to close it. Fuck me. Ki Tech continues folding despite his red bulging face. He desperately holds back his cough. Ki Wu goes to the bathroom and returns moments later with his phone. He shows the family a gif he downloaded. Watch. If we all fold like this girl we might even get paid today. The gif shows the world's fastest pizza box folder a white girl with dazzling box folding skills. She's fast. The family watches in awe. Inspired by the clip they start folding with renewed vigor. Key Tech also picks up speed but he lacks the dexterity of the others. He's getting more and more sloppy. Through the half-open door we see the female pizza shop owner standing outside the entrance. Quirky appearance. Pizza time t-shirt. Look at this for example. This shitty folding job here. The owner shows Chung Sook a botched corner. One out of four. One fourth of the boxes are unusable. One out of four. The family all look at Key Tech. He just smiles. Innocent as ever. Size still you can't cut 10% from my pay. That's too much. Key Wu helps a man load boxes into a van. Key Tech looks out from the apartment window watching Chung Sook squabble with the pizza shop owner. I should pay even less considering the number of botched boxes. We were barely making anything to begin with. Look. It's not that simple. Each ruined box exponentially tarnishes our brand's image. Your brand. 
You only have two stores in Seoul. Fuck this. What did you say? Ki Wu quickly steps in diffusing the situation with an easy smile. It's that kid ISNT it. What are you talking about? The part-timer at your shop. He went Mia didn't he? During such a crucial time too. You have a large group order from the love of Christ Church. That's why you and your husband are out here working your bottoms off. How do you know that? Who told you? That kid he's my friend. Totally unreliable. Not Sostelar reputation. I understand you're upset. 10%. Fine we accept. That's completely within your authority. However. However what? Would you consider hiring a new employee? Fire the loser who bailed on you. The owner just stares at the smiling siblings. What the hell are these people? I can come in for an interview tomorrow. What would be a good time for you? Wait. Hold on. I need to think about this. The owner senses a trap and tries to get out of it. She takes out a few bills from her fanny pack and starts counting one by one. The family all stare. It's been a while since they've seen money. The master bedroom next to the entrance. Wall adorned with pictures of a young Chung Sook competing at a national track and field championship as a student athlete. A shot putter. Great upper body glimpsed through tight uniform. No pictures of Key Tech. Early evening. It's darker. The four family members are gathered around a table filled with various store-bought foods. What a special occasion. The four of us gathered here to celebrate the partial reactivation of our phones as well as our son's upcoming job interview with a national franchise. Key Tech tries to deliver a heartfelt speech like a TV patriarch but severely lacks the gravitas. Chung Sook and Ki Yung are already drinking their beers. Cheers. To family. Re, window that son of a bitch. It's not even dark yet. The family turns to see, a drunk man teetering toward the semi-basement window. Their faces slowly fill with dread. How many times did I tell you? We need to put up a no urinating sign. It'll make them want to do it even more. It's psychology. To Ki Wu go yell at him or something. It's not the right timing the drunk man hasn't unzipped his pants still hovering uncertainly in the dark corner. Hesitates I need to catch him in the act. Isnt it fucking obvious. Just kick him out. To herself I hate this place. Ki Wu gets up still unsure when. A voice booms from afar. Behind the drunk man we see a handsome well-built young man climbing off a fancy scooter. This is Min Hyuk 24. He walks over with a large box in his hands. Is that Min Hyuk? It is. Ki Wu is surprised to see Min Hyuk who continues to yell at the would-be public urinator. What do you think you're doing? You think this is a public toilet? I uh. What are you looking at? Cowed by Min Hyuk's presence the drunk man quickly skedaddles away. Ki Tech taps Ki Wu on the shoulder. Your friend has mucho cojones. It's that college student glow. Look at that confidence. Which Ki Wu obviously doesn't have. A smitten Ki Yung admires Min Hyuk as he walks over to the apartment. He enters. How are you Mr. and Mrs. Kim. Min Hyuk. Good to see you son. What's with the surprise appearance? I texted you. To Ki Yung hey Ki Yung. Ki Yung smiles shyly as she nods. Ki Wu searches through his text messages. We could have met somewhere else. You didn't have to come all this way. I brought this. Min Hyuk shows Ki Wu the box. It's heavy so I had to bring it on my bike. What's this? Ki Yung lifts the flap to see a uniquely shaped stone and a wooden display stand inside. To Ki Tech when I told my grandfather I was going to see Ki Wu he gave me this. Whoa. Ki Tech picks up the large stone. This is a precious viewing stone. Is this an abstract specimen? You know your stones mister. Kim. Pop Pop's been collecting viewing stones since his academy days. Our house is literally filled with these things. Living room study basement. This one is supposed to bring luck. And money. How perfect for us. Symbolic. Yes how serendipitous. Please send him our sincere regards. To herself he should have brought food. 
Ki Yung stabs Chung Suk with her finger. Fortunately, Min Hyuk didn't hear. As a beaming Ki Tech continues to show off useless stone trivia, Min Hyuk and Ki Woo sit at a portable table outside the store drinking soju and chasing it with chips. Min Hyuk's expensive foreign scooter is parked behind him. It visually clashes with the old grocery store and run down alley. I had to bring that stupid rock but it was nice to see your folks. They look good. They're not as good as they look. They're all jobless. Ki Young's at home too. She doesn't take college prep classes. It's not that she doesn't want to. She can't. Ki Woo downs a shot of soju. Min Hyuk looks at Ki Woo. He has something to say. He takes out his phone and shows Ki Woo a picture of a brightly smiling teenage girl. High school uniform. Innocent. Cute right. Is that her? The girl you're tutoring. Min Hyuk nods. Park Da Hei. A sophomore. I want you to tutor her. Take over for me as her English teacher. That makes no sense. Her family's loaded. The gig pays really well. That gets Ki Woo's attention. He looks at the picture again. She's a good kid. I want you to look after her until I come back from the study abroad program. You have plenty of friends at school. Why do you want a high school grad to teach your prized student? Why do you think? I shudder just thinking about those female starved engineering students drooling around her like hungry wolves. It's revolting. Ki Woo studies Min Hyuk. Laughs you like her don't you? Nods I am serious about her. I am going to ask her out in two years once she's in college. I want you to take care of her while I am gone. I trust you. I appreciate the trust but you want me to pretend I am a college student. Ki Woo think about it. How many times have you taken the college entrance exam? Twice before your military service and twice after, a grand total of four times. Grammar vocabulary composition speaking. You're an English master. Far more qualified as a tutor than I am. Better than those spoiled college brats who drown their brain cells in booze every day. That may be true but you think the family would accept me. I am not even a college student. Well embellish a little. You'll be fine. You'll have my recommendation. And the mother is a bit Min Hyuk picks up his glass to drink when he suddenly becomes thoughtful. He smiles. She's simple. Young and simple. English simple. What do you mean? English I don't know. Just simple. Min Hyuk and Ki Woo start conversing in English for no reason. They're fluent. I hear Ki Young is handy with Photoshop. Ki Young is working at the computer clicking the mouse and tapping various keyboard shortcuts with dizzying speed. She's like a magician. On the monitor is a document, Certificate of Enrollment with Laser Focus Ki Young refines the edges of the red certification seal. This is amazing. How come you keep failing the art school exam? Shut up dickwad. The siblings work discreetly in the corner of the large internet CAF. Take your time. Looking around we should hold off on the printing until the place clears out. Ki Tech is on the floor laying his head on the viewing stone. He admires the freshly printed enrollment certificate. Look at this. There should be a major for document forgery at Seoul National University. Ki Yun would be top of the class. Shut up and wish the boy good luck for his interview. My son Ki Tech sits up. I am so proud of you. A slightly awkward and embarrassing moment. They all know Ki Woo did nothing to be proud of. Ki Woo finishes touching up his hair in front of the mirror. He picks up the fake certificate. I don't consider this a crime. No. Because I plan on going to this school next year. That's my son. Man with a plan. I am just using some of their administrative services in advance. A quiet road snaking up the hill of a wealthy neighborhood. High walls. Not a pedestrian in sight. Except Ki Woo who consults the map on his phone as he walks up the hill backpack strapped. He looks around. Walks faster. Ki Woo stands in front of the gate which is at the top of a steep stairway. He waits through the melodic doorbell until a voice finally answers. The voice is middle-aged female. Who is it? Mrs. Park. 
Hi I am Min Hyuk's friend. Oh hello. Please come in. Clank. The gate is unlocked and Ki Woo walks into. Ki Woo stops midway and admires the trees overcome with awe. Quite a view isnt it. Mrs. Park pleasure to meet you. Oh no. I am the housekeeper. Please follow me. Moon Kwong 45 fashionable and poised enough to be mistaken for the owner leads Ki Woo inside. Stunning garden. The inside is even more stunning. Ki Woo carefully follows Moon Kwong inside. Indeed the interior is stunning. But not excessive. The furniture and decorations are all tasteful. Do you know Namgung Hyunja? The famous Korean French architect. Ki Woo is blank. This used to be his house. He built it. I see. Now it's just Da Hae's house. Moon Kwong stops just short of the fabulous living room overlooking the garden arriving at the equally fabulous and spacious. She seats Ki Woo at the large wooden table. Please wait here. I'll get Mrs. Park. Moon Kwong exits and Ki Woo is left alone in silence. He quietly gets up and looks around. There's some kind of avant-garde art hanging on the wall. Next to it he sees a typical Korean family portrait taken at a studio. Ki Woo walks over to the window which overlooks the backyard. He sees, a woman dozing off at the patio table. English magazine open on the table. Head tilted comically. Only her soft white neck is visible. This is Yan Kyo 41. Moon Kwong walks over and claps her hands loudly next to Yan Kyo's ears. Yan Kyo sucks her drool in and slowly raises her head. We hear their muffled voices through the window. The tutor is here. What do you think of him? Smiles I don't know but he's handsome. Yan Kyo sits with Ki Woo at the dining table. She pulls out the fake certificate halfway glimpses at it then puts it back in. Ki Woo is nervous. Even the dog cradled in Yan Kyo's arms is watching him. Panting. Disapproving. I don't care about papers. I only wanted to see you because you were recommended by Min Hyuk. I guess you two are good friends. Ki Woo listens quietly. I am sure you know better than I do but Min Hyuk is just the most brilliant human being. I don't even care about the grades. Da Hei and I absolutely adored him. Do you know what I mean? Of course. We just loved him so much. I wanted him to stay with Da Hei through her college exams next year but now he's leaving to study abroad and I am suddenly left without a tutor. I mean what am I supposed to do? Ki Wu listens respectful. Excuse my bluntness but I just don't see the point of hiring someone unless he's as utterly outstanding as Min Hyuk you know. Moon Kwong sneaks a glance at Ki Woo as she brings coffee over to the table checking him out. Clink. She sets it down loudly in front of Ki Woo. I guess what I wanted to ask was, would it be okay if I sat in for today's class? I want to see the whole thing. Judge for myself. I would like to see your, methods. Uh. English is that okay with you? Yan Kyo suddenly blurts out a question in English. Her English is terrible. Ki Woo follows Yan Kyo up the large oppressive staircase trying his best not look at her conspicuously swaying hips. He arrives on the second floor where he sees, a long hallway with several doors on each side. A large pretty room. Yan Kyo and her dog are sitting on the bed watching Ki Woo. The attention doesn't bother Ki Woo who is calmly focused on Da Hae as she works through a practice test. Are you sure about question 14? Hesitant is it wrong? I am asking you. What does your gut say? Do you think number 14 is right? Da Hei shrinks. You were working on other questions before you came back to 14. Am I right? Yes. Ki Woo suddenly snatches Da Hei's wrist shocking both Da Hei and her mom. He presses his thumb gently and feels her pulse like doctor. If this was a real test and number 14 was the first question you would have been in trouble from the start. He presses harder. See. You pulse as irregular. Your heart doesn't lie. Da Hei turns bright red. Yan Kyo is speechless either appalled or in awe. What are you supposed to do in a test? You move forward. You need to seize the flow. The rhythm. If not you're screwed. 
I don't care about question number 14. I only care about how you seize the flow. How you conquer the test as a whole. You get it. Da he is quiet. A test is all about confidence. English attitude. Stunned silence. Ki Wu finally lets go of Da He's wrist revealing a round pink spot where he held her. Ki Wu looks over at Yan Kyo. She's completely floored. I know. You were angry. Frustrated. You worked so hard. Studied until your nose bled. But your test scores weren't improving. You keep asking yourself what am I doing wrong that triggers something in Da He. Emotions swell and her pupils tremble. I am here to prepare you for the real thing. I am not here to help you learn. I am here to help you score. Close on a thick money envelope being handed to Ki Wu. It'll pay you each month on this day. As for the lesson I was thinking three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That sounds good. It's a little more than what Min Hyuk used to get. Cost of living and so forth. Thank you. As Ki Wu puts away the envelope Moon Kwong brings over a fruit plate. She's noticeably friendlier than before. To Moon Kwong I guess it's time to get to know each other. Mr. Kevin will be Da Hei's English teacher. Of course. Mr. Kevin you let me know if you need anything at all during your lessons, snacks, drinks, whatever. I appreciate it. Feel free to pester her if you need anything in this house. She's the expert. She knows it better than I do. They continue exchanging pleasantries when, thunk. A plastic arrow flies in and hits Moon Kwong's shoulder. When Ki Wu looks over, it's a boy in a Native American costume about to shoot another arrow. This is Da Song Ten, the youngest park. Da Song. Behave yourself. We have a guest. Da Song doesn't care. He continues shooting. Moon Kwong is used to the antics. She picks up an arrow and rubs it in her armpit. Silly laugh armpit attack. No. It stinks. Da Song plucks a toy axe from his belt and starts running in slow motion toward Moon Kwong. He screams like a warrior. Moon Kwong does the same flailing in fake slow motion. They make quite a pair. Size I apologize. Our son is a little, unique. Unique is good. He has trouble focusing. ADHD. We signed him up for the Cub Scouts hoping the discipline would help but he's become an even bigger weirdo. Now he's obsessed with Indians. Laughs the Scouts have roots in American Indian culture so he has the right idea. You were a scout too. Yes I learned a lot as a scout. Look how fine you turned out. What's wrong with him? Then serious he's actually an art prodigy you know. Did you see the drawings? Re, pictures on the wall those are his. Ki Wu turns toward the avant-garde drawings on the wall. He gazes for a long moment. A lot of symbolism. Such strong point of view. Right. Strong. I knew you would get it mister. Kevin. Ki Wu takes a couple of steps back and admires the drawings with a serious face. I see. It's an interpretation of a chimpanzee. It's a self-portrait. Awkward. Crickets chirp as Da Song and Moon Kwong continue to battle it out in the background. Of course. Us grown-ups are too jaded to see true genius. That must be why. We've gone through dozens of art teachers. They never last more than a month. Of course Da Song is a bit much to handle. Ki Wu nods. Yan Kyo has come to see him out with the dog in her arms. The gate opens. Ki Wu begins to step out when he stops. Actually. Mrs. Park. Yes. Someone just happened to come to my mind. Her name is. Through Yan Kyo's pov we see the back of Ki Wu's head as he seemingly tries to remember. Girls' generation. The girl group. What was her name, the one who started the jewelry brand? Jessica. Right. Jessica. My cousin has a school friend named Jessica. I don't know her Korean name. She studied applied arts at Illinois State and recently moved back to Korea. Ah Illinois State. What about her? She also tutors and she's known to have a very unique approach to teaching art. Most of all she knows how to handle kids. Interested is that so? 
She's a bit of a celebrity in tutoring circles. Her style is a little unorthodox but it still gets kids into good art schools. She sounds fantastic. I am so curious. Would you be interested in meeting her? She's very busy so I am not sure if I'll be able to get an appointment. Jessica. Laughs why Jessica. So tacky. Ki Young is getting her hair done at the neighborhood shop. Ki Woo is sucking on a popsicle on the sofa behind her. It has a nice ring. Anyhow. She's a nice lady. Young. Not the brightest tool in the shed. The money is good and most of all she's a believer. She's religious. Track back to reveal, Chung Sook and Ki Tech sitting next to Ki Young also getting their hairs trimmed. No it's just she tends to trust people rather easily. They become thoughtful. Ki Tech breaks the silence. She sounds like a great lady. Right. Yeah. The family members all nod. A strange excitement appears on their faces. Ki Wu and Ki Young both take a deep breath in front of the gate. Ki Young looks like a completely new person with short stylish hair and makeup. Ki Wu is about to ring the doorbell when Ki Young stops him. She suddenly starts clapping a beat with her hands. Singing Jessica Only Child Chicago Illinois My classmate Jin Mo is cousin of Kevin she sings her bio to the tune of a catchy Korean oldie. Ki Wu joins. Silly. Ridiculous. But you can sense a real sibling bond. Finally Ki Wu presses the button and the doorbell rings throughout the quiet neighborhood. We find Da Song at the bottom of the stairs peeking inside the kitchen where, Yan Kyo is interviewing Ki Yun. They talk quietly. Formal. Serious. Ki Wu sits a few feet away. Da Hei tiptoes down from second floor and sees Da Song peeking. She flicks his forehead and sends him upstairs. She then looks inside the kitchen herself. She focuses on Ki Yung scrutinizing suspicious. I should go upstairs for my lesson. I'll let you two talk. To Ki Yung Jessica nice meeting you. Ki Wu gets up and nods to Ki Yung. I'll see you next time. Ki Yung also stands up cordial. Thank you Kevin. Da Hei sees Ki Wu coming and runs back up the stairs. Da Hei hurries back to her desk and pretends to work on her problems. The door opens and Ki Wu enters. He sits next to Da Hei. Where did we leave off? Number. You know. What is it? You know it's all an act right? My brother. What are you talking about? It's all fake. Acting all bizarro. Like he's a crazed artist. He's a big fraud. Da Song. You know like he would stop in the middle of the street and pretend he was struck by a sudden inspiration. Laughs randomly stare up at the clouds and ponder the shapes. Something like that. Exactly. He's the worst. And he acts like he can't behave normal. Like he's completely perplexed. Makes me want to puke. So Da Song is a fraud. What does that have to do with your English problems? Dae Hae pouts when Ki Woo suddenly returns to tutor mode. I am just saying. Good. Now those were all great descriptions of Da Song. Why don't we use them to compose a paragraph in English? You must use the word pretend at least twice. Ki Woo Master Tutor skillfully guides the conversation back to the lesson. But Da Hae still has something on her mind. She puts down her pen. Can I ask you something? What now? The teacher downstairs. Ms. Jessica. Is she really your cousin's friend? This catches Ki Wu off guard. He disguises it with a smile. I don't know what you're talking about. She's your girlfriend ISNT she. Ki Wu relaxes and laughs. He looks at Da He who is all worried and serious. She's cute. Come on. I just met her today. Pouting she's very pretty. Not even interested. She is pretty. A beauty even. I knew it. You are interested. If you were a perfect 10 maybe she would be a 6. 6.5. A cheesy line but Da Hei smiles pleased. Suddenly she grabs Ki Wu's wrist under the desk. She presses it gently feeling his pulse. A bold unexpected move on her part. Ki Wu stares quietly at Da Hei. Slowly they grow closer. Lips converge. A soft gentle kiss held through silence until. 
They hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Let's study. Right. Yan Kyo and Ki Yung pass Da He's room and walk toward Da Song's. Yan Kyo turns to Ki Yung nervous. I should tell you. He's not good at staying in one place. Apologetic I hope you understand. It's fine. Ki Yung has no expression. Nothing phases her. Yan Kyo hesitates before finally opening the door to reveal. A huge clutter. Covered with Da Song's drawings as well as pictures of Native American tribesmen. All kinds of Indian themed toys. A teepee tent imported from America. Da Song is lying on the floor with a toy arrow tucked between his legs. Staring at the ceiling. In his own world. This may also be an act. Would you mind leaving? Excuse me. I don't allow parents to sit in during lessons. Yan Kyo is surprised. She continues to linger but Ki Yung's stare is unwavering. I just thought since it's the first day as you can see the boy is a bit. You should wait downstairs. Yan Kyo finally backs down subdued by Ki Yung's authority. She walks out of the room. Yan Kyo and Moon Kwong nibble on nuts as they pass time in the kitchen. The dog licks Yan Kyo's face which is full of agony worry curiosity. Moon Kwong sees Yan Kyo's state. Would you like some plum extract? I can add some honey. It'll help you relax. What? Oh. Sure. Moon Kwong walks down a narrow set of stairs to the. Stocked with all kinds of foods beverages and other household necessities. On one side is a cabinet filled with numerous glass jars, hand extracted plum tangerine and fig concentrates. Moon Kwong picks up the plum bottle and twists the tightly locked lid when, Yan Kyo hurtles down the stairs. I have an idea. This is what we'll do. What? You'll take two plum juices to Da Song's room. You're not a parent so you can go in. You'll just be delivering the drinks. You're right. It'll take a quick peek and let you know how they're doing. Damn it. Why didn't I think of this before? Moon Kwong and Yan Kyo hurry back up the steps with a cup of plum extract. They are startled to see, Ki Yung and Da Song waiting in the kitchen already done with their lesson. Yan Kyo tries to hide her surprise. You guys are. Done. Ki Yung is holding a picture drawn by Da Song. Da Song is standing politely behind her. Mrs. Park will you please have a seat. Nervous sure. Da Song you go up. Yan Kyo and Moon Kwong are stunned to see, Da Song obediently bowing and heading up the stairs. What? Ki Yung hands Yan Kyo the drawing. Da Song drew this today. Yan Kyo is scared. She has no idea what's going on. Ki Yung clocks Moon Kwong peeking over Yan Kyo's shoulders. I'd like to speak to you alone. Oh this is. Can you please give us a moment? Yan Kyo's voice falters at Ki Yung's ice cold demeanor. Moon Kwong stares hard at Ki Yung before walking away. I mentioned earlier that I am also studying art therapy. Yes, I remember. Re drawing did something happen to Da Song when he was in first grade. Yan Kyo yelps loudly. She quickly covers her mouth. Her hands start shaking. I feel a bit cautious about bringing this up, it's the first day after all, but I'll need to know what happened to Da Song in order to truly understand him. When he was in first grade tearful I am sorry. I don't know if I can talk about this right now. It's fine. We can talk about it later. Ki Yung puts a finger on the drawing. Here. This lower section is what's called the schizophrenia zone in psychology. It contains clues about the mental state of the child. Do you see this particular shape drawn here? Yes. Yes I do. Yan Kyo suddenly looks up from the drawing and stares at the large framed picture on the wall. My gosh. It's in the other drawing too. Same spot. Ki Yung looks back at the picture. Yes. Same spot same pattern. Yan Kyo nods fervently. She sobs harder. She feels like a horrible mother. I see that picture every day. Every time I eat. Sobs I had no idea. You don't have to beat yourself up. These drawings are records of Da Song's emotions. A black box of his soul. I'd like to try and unlock that box. But I'll need time. Of course. 
Please take as much time as you need. I can wait. Come I suggest four two-hour sessions a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. This is different from regular tutoring, it's art therapy, so I would need to be compensated at a higher rate. Of course. I understand. Ki Yung continues her performance as multi-certified art teacher and therapist Jessica when, we hear a car pull into the garage. Moments later Dong I K Park 45 Yan Kyo's husband and Da Song's father emerges from the stairs next to the front entrance. We notice the automated motion sensor lights blinking above the main entrance as Dong I K walks in. Yun 31 the driver follows up with Dong I K's things. Oh Yan Kyo wipes her tears. Dong I K. Say hi to Ms. Jessica Da Song's new art teacher. She just started today. To Jessica in English Jessica this is Dong I K. Kurt hello. Dong I K looks tired. But even the fatigue adds to his mystique and cool as a high-flying CEO. He shares a brief handshake with Ki Yung. Thank you for helping Da Song. To Yan Kyo are they done for the day? Yes they just finished. To Yun sorry Yun but are you busy tonight? Would you mind taking Ms. Jessica home? I don't want her walking down the hill alone at night. Ki Yung sits quietly in the back. She looks quite natural in the backseat of the swanky Mercedes. Yun sneaks glances at Ki Yung through the rearview mirror. Where do you live Ms. Jessica? I might as well just drive you home. It's fine. Just drop me off at Haiwa Station. Thank you. Ki Yung's cold demeanor intrigues Yun instead of putting him off. He's attracted. He tries again. Doesn't matter if it's far. I am done for the day. I'll get off at Haiwa. Yun looks out the window. It looks like it's about to rain. I bet the Mercedes is way better than the subway. Cutting him off, no. I am supposed to meet my boyfriend at the station. I see. Yun's smile disappears. He quietly turns the steering wheel. Ki Yung stares at the back of Yun's head thinking. Then, she slowly reaches under her skirt and starts rolling down her underwear. Her eyes twinkle in the dark as she holds the removed underwear in her hands. Did you drive Benz's when you were a designated driver? Not when I was at the designated driver service. I drove a lot of them when I was a valet. When were you a valet? After the fried chicken and before the Taiwanese Castella. About six months I'd say. Nah. It was after the Castella shop went bust. Key tech and family stack food onto their already mountainous plates as they move along the buffet line. They're at a large budget restaurant frequented by bus and taxi drivers. Ki Wu makes sure no one is listening before. We're already starting phase three. I planted a little trap in the Mercedes. We'll see if he bites. Then it's begun. Looking around father how amazing is this? We just so happen to be eating at a buffet for drivers. How symbolic. Key Tech doesn't get it but beams anyway. This place is amazing. You guys eat as much as you want. You're not even buying you big bum. They are. Key Tech is still happy. He's grown immune to Chung Suk's insults. Here. He puts some of his meat on Ki Woo's plate. Have some of this son. Thanks dad. To Ki Yung by the way what did you say to Mrs. Park yesterday? Why? She was over the moon about you. Saying that you were a godsend. A freaking miracle fedexed from heaven. Laughs I just googled art therapy and did a little improv and she just lost her shit. Started crying like a baby. Can't believe how gullible she is. Dong I K is going through some papers in the back when one drops under the seat. As he reaches down to grab it, he sees a vague white shape beneath the passenger seat. He picks it up. A pair of women's underwear. Ki Yung's. Dong I K looks disgusted. He stares hard at the back of Yun's head before putting the underwear in his pocket. Dong I K rushes up the garage stairs. He passes the blinking motion sensor lights and stomps toward the What's wrong? Something happened. Dong I K checks to see if the kids are around. It's Yun. That son of a bitch. I found this under the car seat. Dong I K pulls out the panties from his pocket. 
Yan Kyo gasps shocked. Perhaps more outraged than necessary. You pay him well don't you? He doesn't have money to go to a hotel. Is he saving that money for something? Maybe he's a sexual deviant. He might get off on doing it in his boss car. Yan Kyo sees, Dong I K is in no mood. I am sorry babe. I had no idea that he was such a perv. I don't care who or what he screws. That's his business. I get it. He's a young guy. But why does he have to do it in my car? And why in the backseat? That's my space. Is he trying to mark his territory? With his dirty comb stains. Son of a bitch crossed the line. Yan Kyo doesn't know what to do. Her husband rarely gets this upset. Dong I K calms down and looks at the underwear. Quiet you know what's even weirder. Nervous what? Don't you see? Think about it. Yan Kyo is freaked out of her mind. So they have sex in the car. It's not unusual to leave behind a few strands of hair maybe an earring. But how do you forget your underwear? It's true. You don't just forget to put on your knickers. That's why. I am more concerned by his partner. Her mental state. Do you know what I mean? Dong I K checks the surroundings before whispering something in Yan Kyo's ear. Turning pale like methamphetamine. Cocaine. Shish. What do we do? If they find some kind of white powder in your car we're all doomed. Calm down babe. Relax. We don't want to go too far. Not yet. For now it's just a suspicion. A well-founded one. As the parks continue to fret over the panties camera booms up. Ki Yung standing on the stairs with her bag listening to the conversation. We can't even take something like this to the police. And it would look ridiculous if I tried to interrogate him. What would I say? Yun did you have sexual intercourse in my car then that's why I was thinking. Yes dear. You have to take care of this. Come up with some kind of bland harmless reason. Let him go quietly. Don't even mention the panties. Or the intercourse. I understand. We don't want the neighborhood birds gossiping about the park's driver sexing up the boss car. Exactly. Our names will forever be linked with his disgusting behavior. Yan Kyo nods then thinks. You don't think Yun would post something online do you? Go on a Twitter vendetta. He could announce to the whole world that he was unfairly fired by a famous tech CEO. Well pay him severance. Enough to keep him quiet. Just choose your words carefully when you let him go. Then we'll be fine. Just then Ki Yung starts walking down the stairs. Stepping loudly so the parks can hear. Yan Kyo leaps out of her seat. Dong I K quickly hides the underwear and puts on an awkward smile. Smiling are you guys done? How was Da Song today? Yan Kyo and Ki Yung walk toward the gate. Yan Kyo sidles up to Ki Yung acting friendlier than usual. Ms. Jessica I wanted to ask. The other night when Yun took you home. Yes. This may sound weird but did anything happen that night? No. I went straight home. Good good. Relieved that's good to hear. Such a nice man. I asked him to drop me off at Hiwa Station but he kept insisting that he would take me home. Raising her voice so the bastard went to your house. At night. He knows where you live. No. I just got off at Hiwa. Size thank God. You did the right thing. English nice Jessica. Did something happen to him? Yan Kyo opens the gate. He will he won't be working for us anymore. There was a bit of an incident. You don't need to know the details. That's too bad. He seemed like a nice man. You're so precious Ms. Jessica. So innocent. You still have a lot to learn about this world. Ki Yung stifles her laughter as she walks down the steps. She sees Moon Kwong walking back home with the park's three dogs in the distance. Yan Kyo waves at them. Sighs we used to like him too. We were excited to have a driver who was young and hip. I thought most people preferred older drivers. Yes it's true. Older drivers tend to drive more carefully. They're more sophisticated. My uncle had a driver who was like that. Mr. Kim. A real gentleman. Such a kind man. 
We used to follow him like an uncle. Really? Yes. He was such a warm and kind-hearted person. Unfortunately my uncle was transferred to Chicago and had to let Mr. Kim go. I don't know what he's doing these days. I am very interested in this person Ms. Jessica. Do you think I could meet him? As you can see it's becoming harder and harder for me to trust people. I won't hire anyone unless they're recommended by people I absolutely positively trust. I just have a feeling he could be a great candidate since you grew up with him and all. Moon Kwong walks within earshot and hears the conversation. Her curiosity is piqued. The dogs wag their tails and swarm Yan Kyo. Would you like to meet him? English are you serious? English I am deadly serious. Korean I think this is the best way to hire people. Through people I trust. It's like a what should I call it Yan Kyo makes a peculiar hand gesture. Belt of Trust as the scene's theme music titled The Belt of Trust begins to play we cut to the inside of a key tech is in the driver's seat. We don't know whose car this is or where we are. He tries buckling the seat belt. Presses various buttons on the instrument panel. Ki Wu is in the backseat telling his father to try this and that. When some people approach the pair hop out of the car and move on to another one revealing that, we are inside a large Mercedes dealership in the middle of Gangnam. Ki Tech and Ki Wu continue to explore brand new Benzes sharing quality father and son time. An office overlooking Seoul's soaring skyscrapers. Dong I K is in a meeting with his hogs. He suddenly looks up at the other side of the glass wall where, Ki Tech is sitting in a chair waiting patiently to be seen. Mouthing sorry. Ill. B. Right. With. You. Don't worry sir. Mouthing gesturing take. Your. Time. This isnt a test or anything so you don't have to be nervous. I just wanted to get out of the office. I was dying in there. Key tech is in the driver's seat. The belt of trust continues under the scene. I understand. You're surrounded by people all day. I am sure you want some peace in the car. Key Tech turns off the car's navigation. Thank you. You must know your way around the city. Every highway road and alley south of the DMZ. When you do this for 30 years it becomes second nature. I admire people who work in one profession their whole lives. It's a simple job really. But I take pride in it. Every morning I go on a journey. With a father a CEO or just a solitary man walking through life. It's a sort of companionship. Ah. That's how I've treated my job for the past 30 years. How time flies. The words drip with cheese but somehow they sound heartfelt when Key Tech says it with his humble stammer. As the music crests toward a climax, Key Tech turns the wheel making a smooth left turn. Exquisite corner work. I can feel your experience. As music continues, slow motion of Ki Yun gracefully rhythmically walking down the stairs. She finds, Moon Kwong dozing off at the dining table. Lightly snoring. Dogs circling her feet. Ki Yun stares for a long moment. As she walks past the dining room, she slaps the wall loudly shocking Moon Kwong out of her daydream. Moon Kwong acts like she wasn't sleeping. She's an old fox. She acts like she's Mrs. Park's sister. Moon Kwong leaves a plate of fruits for Ki Wu and Da He. Ki Wu stares at her intently as she walks out. She's been in the house the longest. Longer than the family. She used to work for the previous owner the architect, Nam Gung Hyunja who recommended her to the parks when he moved to France. Told them she takes great care of the house and so on. So she survived an ownership change. Nods it's a made job. Of course she won't just let go. If we want to extract her we'll need to do some prep work. That's right. We need a plan. Chung Suk, Ki Woo and Ki Yung are sitting at the corner table. We notice the tacky Pizza Time logo everywhere. The pizza shop owner from scene 4 begrudgingly brings a combination pizza over to the table. She hates that she has to serve these losers. Hey how about some more hot sauce here? The owner picks up a hot sauce from the other table and drops it in front of Chung Sook. Chung Sook mouths bitch as the owner walks away. Ki Woo studies the hot sauce. 
He picks it up and squirts two drops on a blank napkin as if testing something. There's something that Dahe told me. I am so sick of apples. I want peaches. Then why don't you just ask for them? Dahe is griping about the fruit plate Moon Kwong brought. She picks up an apple slice and lovingly feeds it to Ki Wu. Pouting we can't have peaches. It's a forbidden fruit in our house. Ki Yung picks up a peach from the fruit section. She holds it in the sunlight and carefully examines the soft fuzz surrounding it. The housekeeper has a severe peach allergy. If she even goes near a peach shell turn red and start hyperventilating. Full on asthma attack. Does everything but kill her. Using a sharp razor Ki Wu meticulously shaves off the fuzz around the peach. He deposits the fuzz in a transparent pen cap. Haunting nerve scraping music plays underneath. Ki Wu walks out of the house after another lesson. He bows to Moon Kwong who is in the yard handing out treats to the dogs. Ki Wu takes out his pen as he passes Moon Kwong. He opens the cap and gently pours peach fuzz over her shoulders. Ki Wu has just walked out of the gate when he hears violent coughing from inside. It's Moon Kwong. He casually walks down the hill as the coughing echoes throughout the neighborhood creating a discordant harmony with the music. Moon Kwong is on the bench talking on her phone. Still covered in red spots. She's unaware that Ki Tech is watching her from several feet away. He takes out his phone and snaps a selfie making sure to include Moon Kwong in the background. Into her phone it was the worst one I ever had. I was sure I was going to die. No. I am telling you. No peaches for miles. That's what I am saying. It's driving me nuts. Yan Kyo carries a bunch of shopping bags out of the department store. Ki Tech is waiting at the Mercedes. He opens the trunk and puts Yan Kyo's bags in. When he's done he continues to linger. He hesitates before taking out his phone. Mrs. Park. I am um, I didn't know if this was worth mentioning but I wanted to make sure. He shows Yan Kyo a photo on his phone. This person behind me. Is that. What hate that's Moon Kwong. So it was her. I didn't quite remember her face. I'd only seen her a couple of times when I went up to the house. Where is this from? Is that a hospital? Yes. I was at the hospital the other day for an annual checkup. I was taking a selfie to send my wife when I saw her behind me. Yan Kyo looks closely at the picture. Looks like she's talking on the phone. Yes see I didn't mean to but I ended up overhearing. Stammering I uh didn't mean to eavesdrop but I happened to be right there and unfortunately uh overheard everything. Cut stop right there. Dad you're overdoing it. The worrying thing. Tone it down. I can tell you're acting. Ki Tech rehearses his scene holding a piece of paper with his lines. Action. I really didn't mean to. I was right there and I just happened to overhear. Interested what did you hear? Ki Tech looks at Yan Kyo through the rearview mirror. He takes a hesitant beat before opening his mouth. I don't know if I should say. Acting I heard her say that she was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Stunned tuberculosis. Are you sure? What was it active pulmonary tuberculosis she was talking on the phone and she seemed very upset. Like she was angry at herself. Female voice I didn't even know tuberculosis was still a thing. I didn't even know tuberculosis was still a thing. Neither did I. I remember years ago we used to buy those seals for Christmas but I thought it was all over. You should look it up. Korea still has the highest tuberculosis rate among OECD countries. I can't believe that Moon Kwong emotional how could she not tell me. I can't. I wasn't sure if I should say anything but I felt like you should know. I mean she was just going about her business like everything was normal. There are young children in the house. Da Song is only 10. And this woman with her tuberculosis is in the kitchen making food and touching the dishes. Stop. Yan Kyo goes into a shrieking fit. Please. No more. The art lesson is in progress. Ki Yung has Da Song in her lap. She touches Da Song's face with her cheek as she looks at his drawing. Ki Yung's cell phone dings. It's a text from Ki Tech, ETA 3 minutes. Get ready. 
Suspenseful music builds as Ki Yung descends the stairs. When she removes her hand from her pocket we see that it's covered in soft peach fuzz. The fuzz glistens in the afternoon sunlight as Ki Yung walks down to the where she opens the fridge and removes a bottle of water. Moon Kwong comes over and hands her a glass. As Ki Yung takes the glass she casually wipes the peach fuzz on Moon Kwong's hand. Our first time inside the garage. Ki Tech carries the many shopping bags up the stairs. Yan Kyo follows when, she hears violent coughing coming from upstairs. Yan Kyo is appalled to see, Moon Kwong coughing like a sick dog as she comes out to greet her and Ki Tech. Moon Kwong tries to take the bags from Ki Tech but the coughing becomes unbearable and she runs to the. She tries to stifle her cough with a napkin. No use. She throws the napkin in the trash and rushes to the bathroom. Yan Kyo is horrified. It's like watching Ebola spread in front of her eyes. Ki Tech just stands there staring quietly at the discarded napkin in the kitchen. If you find an opportunity, do it. Just like we practiced. It'll be the cherry on top. Ki Tech leaves Yan Kyo behind and walks over to the kitchen. He removes his hand from his pocket and reaches into the trash can at which point we cut to, a pizza time hot sauce packet hidden in Ki Tech's palm. Ki Tech quickly squirts the red sauce on the napkin. Our bloody finale. A terrified Yan Kyo watches as Ki Tech removes the bloody napkin from the trash. Ki Tech grimly holds it up in front of her. Yan Kyo becomes dizzy. She closes her eyes to keep herself from fainting. The music that continued through the last several scenes, the belt of trust, comes to a dramatic end. No more music. The house is quiet. We see a text from Yan Kyo on Ki Tech's phone, second floor sauna. Make sure she doesn't see you Ki Tech looks around before quietly treading up the stairs. A small phone booth sized sauna situated at the end of the hallway between the dressing room and bathroom. As soon as Ki Tech walks in Yan Kyo shuts the door and pulls down the roller shades. They are now inches away from each other in the tight space. Light seeps in from outside illuminating Yan Kyo's bloodshot eyes and smeared makeup. Mr. Kim you have to promise you won't tell my husband. Of course. He can't find out that I've been keeping that walking lung disease around the kids this whole time. Hell kill me. Don't worry Mrs. Park. Then I don't want to step out of line but I had a request as well. See I have nothing personal against the housekeeper. Whispering I only acted out of a moral obligation to protect the health and safety of the public. I wouldn't want Mr. Park to think that I am some kind of tattletale. Cutting him off don't worry. I am not even going to mention the tuberculosis to Moon Kwong. It'll come up with a completely unrelated reason. Let her go quietly. I see. Size it's the best way. I've done it before. Well I trust your judgment. Ki Tech puts out his hand as if he wants to officialize their top secret deal. They are sharing the most awkward handshake in the world when Yan Kyo suddenly cringes. Did you wash your hands Mr. Kim? The backyard seen through kitchen windows. Strong winds shake the trees. A storm is en route. Yan Kyo is seated at the patio table with Moon Kwong. Her face is cold as she calmly explains something to her soon-to-be former housekeeper. Moon Kwong's face gradually turns dark. Moon Kwong carries a large bag down the hill. Still in disbelief. Devastated. Her hair dances wildly in the rough wind. The sky is getting darker. Moon Kwong keeps looking back at the house as she walks away. She stops and stares at the firmly closed gate for a long time. It's raining outside. Mr. Kim do you know a place where I can get some good short ribs? Somewhere not too far. Of course. Ki Tech turns the wheel and switches lanes. You'll be eating out tonight. Yes. I suddenly had a craving for juicy short ribs. Since I can't have them at home now. Key Tech makes an effortless U-turn across the large eight-lane road. The raindrops on the window swerve diagonally. Smiles our housekeeper used to make the best short ribs. You mean the lady who just quit yesterday. She was with us for a long time. I don't know why she suddenly left. Mrs. Park wouldn't even tell me. 
I mean there's no shortage of housekeepers looking for work so I guess we can just hire another one. But it's a real pity. She was a great lady. I see. She took care of all the little things in the house. And she was a tremendous cook. Most importantly she never crossed the line. If there's one thing I hate it's people who cross the line. Well I guess she did have one flaw. Laughs she was a big eater. Ate twice as much as other people. But I suppose she worked twice as hard to make up for that. I guess Mrs. Park will need to find a new housekeeper soon. Nods or the house will descend into chaos. I guarantee she won't be able to survive a week without one. Shambles I tell you. My clothes will start smelling laughs Mrs. Park definitely wins the worst homemaker award. Doesn't know her way around a vacuum and her cooking is just abysmal. But you still love her don't you? Key text suddenly serious comment catches Dong I.K. off guard. Silence. Then Dong I.K. starts laughing. Hard. Of course I love her. I don't know what else you'd call this. Then maybe you should look at this key tech removes a business card from his pocket and hands it to Dong I.K. On beautiful ivory colored stock only the name the care is printed in elegant typography. No number. No address. The care. What is this? I just found out about them recently too. It's a membership based total care company. Catering to families of VIPs like yourself. They provide maids in-home caregivers also drivers like myself. From what I hear they select only the best. The most experienced workers. Looks very nice. Dong I K flips the card to the other side. The design is gorgeous. How did you learn about this company Mr. Kim? They called me about working for them. I guess I am one of the more experienced drivers around so they wanted to recruit me. I turned them down because I was already scheduled to meet you. I see. Nods well I am honored that you chose me over such a reputable company. I am forever grateful Mr. Kim. Dong I K laughs. Laughs you're being ridiculous sir. They're laughing but there's a subtle underlying tension between the two men. There's still a line that Dong I K won't cross. He suddenly drops his smile. Well then. I guess I'll just give this to Mrs. Park. Yes you should. But don't say I gave it to you. Smiles you should tell her that you looked it up yourself. Laughs good idea. That's sure to earn me some points. Thank you Mr. Kim. Their membership only so I don't think they have a website or anything. There's a consultation number in the back. Ring ring ring. Ki Yung picks up an old flip phone with the care business card taped on front. She sounds like a completely different person. Sweet. Welcoming. Into the phone thank you for calling the care. This is senior advisor Yo Myung Sun. How may I help you? Chung Suk and Ki Tech watch Ki Yung as they eat breakfast. She could have won an Oscar if she became an actress. She has a nice voice doesn't she? Just like me. Yan Kyo has the phone on speaker. She has disposable kitchen gloves on and is generally floundering in the kitchen overloading the dishwasher and sterilizing the disease-ridden pots and pans in an oversized steamer. Into the phone I heard I need to sign up for a membership. That's correct. We are a membership-only service. If you aren't currently a member I can guide you through the steps to become one. Into the phone sure okay. Do you have a pen? I can give you the list of forms you need to submit. A fully transformed Chung Sook sits at the white patio table with Yan Kyo. Classy hairstyle. Tasteful makeup. Yan Kyo goes through Chung Sook's papers especially focusing on her doctor's note. Just then a white butterfly flits by Chung Sook's face its wings playfully bouncing off the bright summer light. Over the idyllic scene a beautiful aria begins to flow. As music continues, steadicam shot, we glide up the stairs first following Chung Sook's feet then rising up to shoulder height tracking her from behind as she walks down the second floor hallway. She opens the door to. We follow Chung Sook as she walks in and sets down a plate of fruits in front of Da Hei and Ki Wu. Yay. Peaches. Please have some too Mr. Kevin. Thank you ma'am. 
Chung Suk pinches Ki Woo's earlobe while Da He is not looking. Ki Woo nearly jumps. Chung Suk just smiles and walks out of the room. We continue to follow her as she pads down the hall and enters. Where we see the teepee in the corner. The flap opens and Ki Yung peeks out to see who it is. Da Song is tightly cuddled up between her arms drawing a picture. He looks at Chung Suk embarrassed. Next time just knock and leave the food outside. Sorry. Please don't come in during the lesson. Chung Suk scoffs. She mouths just eat the damn peaches as she hands over the plate. She looks around at the drawings in the room. Not impressed. She steps out into the. We hear Dong I K arriving downstairs. Da Song hears it too. He bolts out of the room and flies past Chung Suk toward the. Daddy. Did you get the walkie? Da Song. Lesson's not over yet. This guy. That's all you think about ISNT it. Camping. Dong I K picks up Da Song and holds him tightly. Camera circles around them and shows Key Tech emerging from the garage with a bunch of boxes. Brand new camping supplies. On top is a walkie talkie box. Wow. T-667. Dope. What's all this stuff? We just bought camping gear last year. These are different. Might as well complete the collection. Da Song has already opened the walkie talkie box. He also goes through the other items, campfire supplies and acts for. As Ki Tech walks out he quickly feels up Chung Suk's behind. Chung Suk giggles to herself as she goes to the kitchen sink. The long steadicam shot is about to come to a glorious end after showing the semi-basement's family complete and successful infiltration of the park mansion. Wait. Not yet Da Song suddenly starts sniffing the air. He runs over to Chung Suk and shoves his nose in her belly startling her greatly. Da Song then darts over to Ki Tech and shoves his nose in his pant leg. Da Song. What's wrong with you? Same smell. They smell exactly the same. Ki Tech and Chung Suk freeze. Yan Kyo embarrassed roughly pushes Da Song away. Stop talking nonsense and go up to your room. Ms. Jessica is waiting. That's weird. Ms. Jessica has the same smell. Dong I K laughs awkwardly. To Ki Tech he's a little out there. They all laugh but no one is laughing inside. The table teams with food. We notice the viewing stone displayed prominently in the middle. An interesting decorating choice. Ki Tech is cooking ribs and mushrooms on an electric skillet when he suddenly smells his clothes. He scared me the little punk. Does this mean we all have to use different soaps? Maybe we should all wash our clothes with different detergent. Different fabric softeners too. You mean I have to wash all of your clothes separately? Fuck no. Expressionless it won't work. It's the basement smell. Ki Woo is blank. The smell won't go away unless we leave this place. Truth bomb. They all fall silent at the brutal reality check and for a while we only hear the sizzling of the grill. Ki Tech picks up his Sapporo and tries to change the subject. Forget about that. This is a good problem to have. Think about our lives before. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Hundreds of college graduates compete for a security guard job for Christ's sake. Emotional not us. We are all gainfully employed. You're right father. Cheers. Sure we may not be getting six-figure salaries but it's no small amount if you combine our wages. The parks are investing a great part of their fortune in our family. So let us give thanks to Mr. Park our generous employer. A great man. And how can I forget Min Hyuk? How lucky that our son is friends with such a thoughtful young man. It's all because of him that fuck. Do they always have to ruin the moment? The family members all turn toward the window which is being rattled by a robust stream of urine. A short barely standing drunk man is relieving himself in the corner. That mother Ki Wu jumps up. He grabs the viewing stone from the table and walks toward the door. Ki Tech worried quickly runs after him. Scoffs oh no. Here comes the rage machine. Why is he acting tough all of a sudden? Is he trying to kill someone? Ki Tech catches up to Ki Woo and rests the stone from his hands. 
Ki Wu picks up an umbrella instead. He runs out. Ki Yun lights up. This is going to be fun. She opens the high speed photography app on her phone and starts filming. We see the following sequence through the app in slow motion. Ki Wu appears outside the window and starts swinging the umbrella wildly at the short man who sprays urine everywhere as he falls. Ki Tech runs out with a bucket of water. He throws the water at the short man but momentarily loses balance and splashes Ki Wu instead. Ki Yun laughs. This is gold. Chung Suk has no interest. She continues grilling meat happy to finish the food by herself. Unsettling music plays over the wild primal thrashing of the three men. The violent rage-fueled dance dissolves too. The garden is sun-drenched. Da Song looks up at the sky through a piece of soot-covered glass an improvised sun viewer. He has a bow and axe strapped to his back. He pushes the button on his walkie-talkie. Into the radio the sky is mostly clear. Some clouds visible but no rain clouds. Over. Into the radio copy that. I am here in the kitchen and Da He has been infected with a serious case of duck lips if she keeps pouting like that she might actually turn into a duck. She looks pissed over. Dong I K giggles as he teases Da He who looks completely miserable in her camping outfit. What's with the face? Let's all try to have a good time. Can't I just stay home and study with Kevin? I know you hate camping but it's Da Song's birthday. And you're his sister. Come on. It won't be so bad. Well build a fire. Sing happy birthday at midnight. Blow out candles under the stars. It'll be wonderful. Chung Sook brings up a tent bag and a guitar case from the storage basement. Da He gives up and puts on her large Bluetooth headphones shutting out reality. Yan Kyo takes Chung Sook to the living room where the three dogs are. I am sure you know all of their names by now. From left to right Barry Juni Fufu. Of course. Barry and Juni only eat natural balance organic. Yan Kyo emphasizes by pointing at each of the dog's foods in the care basket. Yes. And Fufu also needs this, Kamaboko. Japanese crab cake. And don't hold the leash too short when you're walking Juni. He needs to burn off that energy. It's easy if you think of him as the canine version of Da Song. Don't worry. Yan Kyo is sitting in the driver's seat endlessly rattling off instructions until, the garage door goes all the way up and the Mercedes starts rolling out. Da Song pretends to shoot an arrow from the backseat and Chung Sook grabs her chest like she was shot. Moments later she's finally alone. She presses the button. Her face gradually immerses in darkness as the shutter goes down. Chung Sook is taking a peaceful nap on the large sofa. We hear her soft breathing. Slanted late afternoon rays wrap her face warmly. She slowly wakes up and wipes her drool. When she sits up we see Ki Tech sleeping behind her. Chung Sook looks out at the garden where, Ki Wu is lying in the grass with the three dogs. Looking at the sky. We notice a yellow journal clutched in his hand. What are you doing out there? Come inside. Ki Wu takes a deep breath as he gazes up at the sky. He's never been more relaxed. You should try it. It's nice to be able to see the sky from your own home. He picks himself up and walks into the living room. He stretches his arms as he walks over to the kitchen. Water mom. Sure. Ki Wu gets a few bottles of Evian from the fridge. He gives one to Chung Sook before heading up the stairs. A groggy Ki Tech gets up from the sofa and trudges over to a cabinet in the corner. A variety of whiskies are on display. Ki Yung is taking a bubble bath. She picks up the remote and changes the channel on the wall-mounted TV when. You want a water. Read my mind. Thanks Brody. The door opens a crack and Ki Wu rolls a bottle toward Ki Yung. He then continues on to. Ki Wu throws himself on Da He's bed. He reaches into the space between the bed and the wall and finds a pretty wooden box hidden there. Da He's box of secrets. It has a small combination lock on the front. Ki Wu unlocks the box and puts in the yellow journal he was reading. He then takes out another yellow journal and opens it. Pages filled with Da He's small thoughtful handwriting. Ki Tech sits with a white towel across his lap sweating it out in the steam-filled room. 
He guzzles down a cold bottle of Evian. Refreshing. He turns the hourglass upside down. The sound of myriad sand grains rolling down the glass turns into, the sound of rain. The large coffee table is filled with various whiskey bottles and gourmet snacks. The four family members are comfortably sprawled across the couch and floor. It's like they own the place. They sip whiskey and watch rain falling outside the window. This is classy. Sipping whiskey on a rainy day. Enjoying the view. Key Tech takes several bottles and pours a little of each into his tumbler. What the hell are you doing? Why are you mixing all the booze? This way Mr. Park want notice. It'll be too obvious if we drink from only one bottle. Nice to see you use that brain for once. Barry comes over to Chung Sook wagging her tail but Chung Sook kicks her away. Chung Sook is already drunk. Her face is bright red. But you always get shitfaced when you mix your drinks dad. Smiles Ki Young that's no way to talk to your father. Shitfaced no. Not you too. Let me pour you a shot father. Ki Woo tries to lighten the mood. He looks out the window as he pours a shot with both hands. It's probably raining at the campsite too. They must be having a magical time. Da He and her family. Raindrops pattering the tent. Playing the guitar. By the way. What's that yellow notebook you've been carrying? This. Ki Woo picks up the yellow journal. Da He's diary. Oh my god. Why are you reading that? I just want to understand her on a deeper level. Disgusting. You two going out or something. Nods it's serious. She likes me too. I am going to officially ask her out when she goes to college. For real. They all stare at Ki Woo. He must be shitting them. But he's not. Ki Tech slaps Ki Woo's shoulder. That's my boy. That means this is your future wife's house. The parks will be your in-laws. Laughs I guess that's true. Chung Sook joins the laughter. You mean I am fucking washing dishes for my future in-laws. Hilarious. You're washing your future in-laws tidy whities Your daughter-in-law's school socks. Ki Tech pretends to wash a sock laughing hysterically when he suddenly feels Chung Sook's murderous glare. He slowly stops. Chung Sook downs her whiskey and turns serious. She calmly turns to Ki Woo. I like that girl. She's nice. Pretty. But not full of herself. Well as long as we're getting ahead of ourselves, if you think about it nowadays people barely see their in-laws anyway. How many times do you think families see each other after their kids get married? Scoffs crazy fuck. You hear about people hiring actors to stand in for their parents at weddings. Well do the same thing. A lot of TV extras do that kind of work. Ki Woo points at Ki Young. She did too. Got paid to be one of the bride's guests. She went to a bunch of weddings last year. I even caught a bouquet once. First time I ever saw the bitch. They pay 10 bucks extra for the bouquet. Laughs that's how you became such a good actress. Good times continue as whiskey flows. Jokes and laughter abound. Sure the acting was good but I was surprised that the family was so easy to trick. Especially the missus. Not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I guess we should be thankful for that. Yes she's so innocent. And kind. A rich person who's also kindhearted. Chung Sook stops mid-sip and stares at Ki Tech. Not also kindhearted she's kindhearted because she's rich. You get it. Ki Tech doesn't. Chung Sook looks around. If I had all this my heart would be overflowing with kindness. Chung Sook's voice grows. She gulps downs another glass. That's true. Your mother has a point. Rich people are more naive. They don't have a bitter bone in them. And the kids are happier. No wiseasses. It's the money. Money cures all the little wiseasses. Ki Young slowly grows irritated as her parents go on and on about rich people. She tosses back her whiskey. Ki Wu. That guy. What was his name? Yun. The old driver. Yes. Mr. Yun. He's probably doing fine right. I am sure he got a new job. Of course. He's young. Healthy. 
Plenty of opportunities. Yeah I am sure he got an even better job. Ki Yun slams down her glass and yells at her family. What the hell's wrong with you? Fuck rich people. Just worry about your own goddamn family. Ki Yun looks like she's about to cry. We've never seen her like this before. Vulnerable. Like a hurt child. Dad please. Stop worrying about other people. Look at me. Us. Your son and daughter. We're right here. Almost at the exact moment as Ki Yung's soulful outburst like a timed effect lightning and thunder strike outside the window. Followed by heavy rain. Ki Tech looks out the window. Laughing did you see that? Right on cue. Imitating Ki Yung dad were right here pow. Thunder and lightning. Awesome. Ki Wu tries to console Ki Yung. He brushes her hair and talks in a brotherly voice. Come on now Jessica. Let's drink. Cheers. Ki Wu clinks his glass against Ki Yung's. You know Ki Yung when I saw you upstairs in the bathroom you looked so. What? I looked so what? You just looked so natural in that bathtub. This house. It suits you. You're not like us. Smiles fuck off. To Ki Tech it's true dad. She was in the tub watching TV taking a fancy bubble bath and it just felt like she belonged here. Is that right? Ki Wu becomes more animated at Ki Tech's exaggerated reaction. He opens his arms wide and looks around at the living room. Imagine for a second that this is our house. Let's say we live here. Which room would you like to have? Out of all the beautiful rooms designed by the great Namgung Hyunja which one would you want to be yours? I don't know. Buy me the fucking house first and I'll think about it. We're living here right now aren't we? We're here in the living room drinking and having a good time just like we would if this was our place. That's true. We are currently living here. For all intents and purposes. This is our house right now. Burps nice and cozy. Chung Sook face bulging red flashes a dirty grin. You're cozy huh? That's real nice. What if Park comes back right now? To Ki Yung he would skitter away like a little cockroach. Chung Sook laughs loudly at her own joke. Ki Tech is quiet. Snickering you kids know what I am talking about right? Our apartment. How when we turn on the kitchen lights the roaches all run away and disappear under the cabinets. He would be exactly like that. Ki Tech stares hard at Chung Sook who continues to howl. Ki Tech's eyes are red. Hostile. This is a different key tech. Mumbling fucking bitch. You've gone too far this time. Chung Sook is silent. What? I am a cockroach. Crash. Ki tech sweeps the table and knocks over the bottles and plates. Ki Wu and Ki Yung are stunned. Chung Sook is absolutely still. She glowers at Ki tech who unlike before doesn't back down. He stares right back tension growing when his face starts cracking. He begins to snicker. Chung Sook does too. They both burst into laughter. I got you. I totally got you. The two continue to laugh their asses off. Ki Tech seems especially pleased with his performance. He slaps Ki Wu on the shoulder. How was that Spielberg? Pretty realistic right? You like my acting now? Wow dad. You totally got me. Ki Yung laughs relieved. To Ki Tech shit. You're going to clean this up right. Laughing I didn't believe him for one second. Really? I thought he was really going to kill you. He could never do that. Your father hasn't a single backbone in his body. The epitome of a spineless mo. they are all laughing uproariously when, the doorbell rings loudly throughout the house. They all freeze and look at each other. Who the hell could that be? The doorbell continues to ring. Who could it be at this time? What do you think it is? Chung Sook scurries over to the gate monitor. She sees a familiar round face filling the screen. It's Moon Kwong. She's standing in the rain dressed in all black. What the? Why is she here? It's her right. The old housekeeper. Nods why do you think she's here? Moon Kwong presses the doorbell again and again. It rings loudly throughout the neighborhood. This could go on for a while. What's she doing? Why doesn't she just leave? It's so loud. 
She could go on all night. Cutting her off hold on. I am supposed to be here. I can answer. Before Ki Wu can stop her Chung Sook presses the speak button. Who is it? Hi how are you? I am Mrs. Park ISNT in right. Moon Kwong's speech is slightly slurred. She's had a drink or two herself. I used to work here. For Ma NY many years. The monitor you're looking at. There's a picture above it right. Berry Juni Fufu, from left to right. That's all fine but how can I help you? It's very late. You're my replacement aren't you? Moon Kwong laughs. Sad drunk laughter. Chung Sook remains on guard. Moon Kwong suddenly turns serious. I am so sorry to bother you at this hour. There's something in the basement that I left behind and I was wondering if I could pick it up. I was fired without any notice so I didn't have time to gather all my things. Chung Sook looks at Ki Wu. What do we do? Ki Wu has no idea. This wasn't in our plan. Chung Sook opens the door to reveal Moon Kwong standing in the rain. She looks grotesque with one eye heavily swollen. Her face is eerily and intermittently illuminated by the motion sensor light. Moon Kwong drips water as she walks over to the kitchen. The living room is not fully visible from her vantage point. Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung remain in the dark around the coffee table listening to Chung Sook and Moon Kwong's conversation. I am sorry for the intrusion. Thank you so much for letting me in. She looks over at the kitchen sink. The faucet drips if you turn it that way. Moon Kwong continues to drone on deliriously. We don't know if she's just drunk or crazy. The faucet's fine. What do you need to pick up? Would you like to come down with me? Moon Kwong flashes a creepy grin as she points to the stairs descending into the dark storage basement. Chung Sook is spooked. She hesitates. No thanks. Just hurry up and get what you need. Close on, a drop of water precariously dangling from the kitchen faucet. It's been a while since Moon Kwong went down to the storage room. Chung Sook starts getting worried. She gets up from the chair. A nervous Chung Sook walks down the narrow staircase and peers into the darkness. She hears a strange moan coming from inside and soon discovers, Moon Kwong levitating horizontally in the air. We realize that she actually has her feet set against the wall and is pushing the jar cabinet with her hands. The glass jars rattle as she shoves with all her might. Chung Sook is confused. Can you give me a hand? Help me push. Huh. Tearful he's going to die. Please. What's going on? Just help me first. Chung Sook has no idea what's going on but starts pushing with Moon Kwong. We see Ki Wu Ki Yung and Ki Tech peeking from the staircase. Chung Sook sees something on the ground as she's pushing. Wait. Maybe this is the problem. Chung Sook pulls a bundle of wires stuck under the cabinet. As soon as she does. The cabinet smoothly rolls to the side pretty much on its own as if it's set on rails. It moves out of view to reveal to Chung Sook's great astonishment, a dark steel door hidden behind it. Moon Kwong opens the door and hurries inside. Chung Sook shakes off her shock and follows Moon Kwong down the dark staircase. Babe. Babe. We get glimpses of the dark underground bunker as Moon Kwong waves around the flashlight on her cell phone, low ceiling gray walls a small passageway. Chung Sook covers her nose at the awful smell. Kun Se. Moon Kwong's flashlight finally finds, a pale severely malnourished face. This is Kun Se 45 Moon Kwong's husband. He looks up from his cot woken up by the sound. He blinks his large eyes. Chung Sook looks horrified. Stop yelling. I am okay. Moon Kwong immediately shoves a baby bottle in his mouth and starts feeding him. It's filled with some kind of gruel. No you're not. You're not okay. Weeping why are you in the dark? Why did you turn off the lights? We have to conserve energy. It all comes out of Mr. Park's pocket. Kun Se turns on the light and is startled to see, Chung Sook standing in front of him. He springs from his bed but Moon Kwong pushes him back down. It's fine. We're okay. Moon Kwong points at Chung Sook. She's a friend. She helped me get in here. 
It was the damn wires. They were stuck under the cabinet. No wonder. Laughs weekly I tried everything but I couldn't get it to open. I couldn't go up to the kitchen. Sobbing how many days have you gone without food? I am so sorry babe. Chung Sook is at a loss. Ki Woo Ki Yung and Ki Tech have followed Chung Sook and Moon Kwong down and are eavesdropping from the staircase. They look stunned. What are you people up to? Why are you? I know how this looks. You must think we're crazy. But please Chung Sook. Have some pity. Us domestic workers were sisters. Surprised how the hell do you know my name? Da Song and I still text from time to time. I came here because I knew the family would be on a camping trip. I wanted to talk to you alone. Chung Sook can't believe her ears. Surprise turns to anger. Don't worry sis. No one knows I am here. Moon Kwong removes a pair of wire cutters from her pocket. I cut the wires on the surveillance camera on my way in. That's good right. Huh big sis. Wait. Hold on. Aren't you older than me? I was born in 74. Year of the Tiger. My name is Moon Kwong. Chung Sook is speechless. Moon Kwong points to Kun Se. This is my husband Oh Kun Se. Kun Se smiles innocently as he continues to suck on the empty bottle. Chung Sook regards the scene with disbelief. Moon Kwong takes out a banana from her pocket. She peels it and feeds it to Kun Se. So the whole time you were working here you were smuggling food down from the kitchen. No. Everything he ate came from my pocket. From the money I made here. I never stole anything. Sure. And how long has he been down here? Your husband. Let's see about four years. You gotta be kidding me. Four years three months and seventeen days to be exact. Kun Se laughs. That's right. It's already June. He started living here after Mr. Namgung moved out four years ago. Before Da Song's family moved in. Chung Sook looks around the room. It has a toilet sink small fridge and old-fashioned TV set. Enough amenities to survive underground. Moon Kwong continues to speak blinking her swollen eyes. A lot of these rich people they build bunkers and secret rooms in their homes. You know in case the North Koreans invade or in case creditors come knocking on their doors. Maybe Mr. Namgung felt embarrassed about building such a room. He didn't mention it to the parks when he sold the house. Huh. Nobody in the house knew about the room. Except me. Some balls you got. Well now I know too. And I know what I am going to do. Chung Sook takes out her phone. Call the fucking cops. Moon Kwong drops to her knees and starts begging. No. Please sis. Sobs we're all in the same boat aren't we. We all need a little help to get by. I am not your fucking sister bitch. And I don't need nobody's help. Well I do. I don't have a house. I don't have money. All I have is a mountain of debt. What do you want me to do about it? He's been down here for four years and the loan sharks still won't let go. They're obsessed. They say they're going to kill him. You borrowed from loan sharks. Moon Kwong nods. It's all my fault. Laughs embarrassed I started a cake shop, Taiwanese Castella, and it completely bankrupted us. Kun Se laughs again. A nervous habit. When Ki Tech hears the word Castella his face crowds with emotion. He knows the shame. Moon Kwong hands Chung Sook an envelope. Please take this. What is this? It's not much I know. But I can send you money every month. All I ask is that you come down here every other day and leave him something to eat. Actually no. Once a week is fine. There's a little fridge down here so. Are you crazy? You people are unbelievable get away from me. Chung Sook lifts her phone. I am going to call the cops. Ki Tech and the kids look worried. That wouldn't be good for them either. Ki Tech is awkwardly leaning over listening to the conversation when, his foot slips and he falls down the stairs. He is unable to control his large body and takes down Ki Yung and Ki Wu with him. Ki Yung screams. Chung Sook is startled when she sees the family spilling down the stairs. 
Moon Kwong is even more confused. It's Kevin Jessica and Mr. Kim. Why are they here? What the hell? Laughs Honey who are all these people? Ms. Jessica. Mr. Kim. What's everyone doing down here? Moon Kwong is speechless for a moment before the pieces slowly come together in her head. She takes out her cell phone. As Ki Tech scrambles to get up he accidentally steps on Ki Woo's foot. Ow. Dad my foot. Chung Suk and Ki Yung immediately freeze. Ki Woo realizes what he just said and turns pale. He sees, Moon Kwong recording everything on her cell phone. Now I get it. Nods I knew something wasn't right Moon Kwong plays back the footage she just shot. Ow. Dad my foot. Ki Woo's face and voice are clearly recorded on video. Finally everything comes together for Moon Kwong. Ki Woo is devastated. Now I get it. You're all a family. A family that scams people together. It's not like that. I knew something was off when Yun was fired for no reason. You despicable. Listen sis. I am not your sister you life ruining bitch. Moon Kwong shows Chung Sook her phone. Why don't I send this little video to Mrs. Park right now? The video is already being prepped for transfer on her messenger app. Ki Wu and family are sweating. Ki Tech still a little tipsy from the whiskey says quietly to Ki Yung. There's probably no reception down here. Ki Yung looks at her phone. Actually it's pretty good. Fuck. Please. We really need these jobs and we went through a lot to get them. We're not scam artists. We're. Cutting him off shut up. I don't give a shit. I don't care if we all go to prison. It'll fucking end everything right here. Ki Tech thunders loudly silencing everyone in the room. Ki Wu frowns and covers his ears. Are you crazy lady? Moon Kwong is puzzled by Ki Tech's random outburst. Imagine how upset the parks would be if they saw the video. Screaming they are nice people. And they've shown nothing but kindness. Why would you do that to them? What the? Erase it. Now. If you erase it burps then we can talk. Then I will consider your demands he seems to be doing the method acting thing playing scary key tech but no one's really buying. He's making zero sense. They all just look around. To Chung Sook what's wrong with your husband? Sighs I apologize on his behalf. Now let's all calm down Kun Se is watching the drama unfold when he suddenly loses balance and nearly falls. He's still weak. Moon Kwong sticks her phone out like a gun as she grabs Kun Se. Back off. Or I am going to hit Sin. Ki Tech and family flinch. They slowly back off. Let's get you upstairs. You need some fresh air. Laughs sounds good. All of you go upstairs and stay in one place. If you move one inch out of my sight I am hitting Sin. It's pouring outside. Kun Se is lying face down on the large sofa and Moon Kwong is on top giving him a massage. Ki Tech and crew are kneeling in the corner with their arms raised. It's funny. Your phone. It's like a nuclear button. What are you talking about? They all hide their tails when you say you'll press the button. Laughs you're like North Korea. The phone is Kim Jong Un's nuke. Moon Kwong sits up straight like a military cadet. North Korean accent upon seeing the atrocious acts committed by the family of depraved bandits on mobile camera our dear leader Kim Jong-un determined to deliver fiery justice out of nowhere she starts impersonating a North Korean news anchor. Kun Se laughs like a little kid. I missed your impressions. Ignoring the cowardly ruling of the United Nations Security Council our dear leader announced that he would execute the family of delinquents by firing squad. Laughing no one does Kami impressions better than you. I love you babe. Ki Tech and family stare at Moon Kwong and Kun Se incredulously. Who are these people? What are you looking at? Keep your heads down. They all look down. Moon Kwong starts recording with her cell phone again panning from the family members to the scattered food and booze bottles on the floor. Scumbags. Look at this debauchery. This is how you treat the sublime living room created by the great Namgung Hyunja. Kun Se looks out at the garden. A great living room it is. Remember honey. 
How we would sit here when the weather was nice looking out at the garden. So enchanting. It was. Park would be at work. The kids at school. Yan Kyo would go out shopping and the house would be so quiet. You would come up and we would have tea together. Yes. Royal milk tea. We would enjoy the view listening to Rachmaninoff on the Bluetooth speaker Moon Kwong is lost in sweet reverie when, Chung Sook suddenly runs toward the sofa. Like a linebacker rushing a quarterback she rams the sofa with her hefty frame. Knocking Moon Kwong off balance and making her drop the phone. Immediately Ki Tech dives after the phone, while Moon Kwong tries to retrieve it, then Ki Wu lunges toward Moon Kwong, then Kun Se after him, and of course Ki Yung has to jump after Kun Se. Six bodies desperately intertwined. Twelve hands clawing. Sixty fingers outstretched toward the phone. The view from outside. Through the thick curtain of rain we see six people none of whom actually live in the house chaotically brawling inside. A surreal sight. The rain drowns out the sound. Ki Yung extracts herself from the melee and runs toward the kitchen. Ki Yung opens the fridge. She grabs a black plastic bag from inside and runs back to the. Moon Kwong has the phone back but it's far from over. Chung Sook is choking her from behind and Ki Wu is beside her trying to pry the phone away. We see Ki Tech wrestling Kun Se nearby. Ki Yung rushes back to the living room with the black bag. She pours the contents, a dozen or so peaches, over Moon Kwong's head. Moon Kwong screams. Ki Yung picks up one of the peaches and squashes it against Moon Kwong's face. Moon Kwong sticks her tongue out and starts coughing violently. She rolls on the floor clutching her swollen throat allowing Ki Wu to snatch her phone. At the same time Ki Tech subdues Kun Se and the family seem to have everything under control. Until, the living room phone begins to ring. Chung Sook checks her cell phone. She sees several missed calls from Mrs. Park Shit. When the landline continues to ring the family members silence Moon Kwong and Kun Se by covering their mouths. Chung Sook answers the phone. Into the phone hell low. You're there. You know how to make Japagori right. Spicy Jajong Udon. Into the phone Japagori. Into the phone it's Da Song's favorite. If you start cooking now it'll be ready by the time we get there. There's some prime flank steak in the fridge so you should put that in too. Rain batters the Mercedes. Da Song is in the backseat with his eyes closed. He looks pissed. He's taken Da Hei's reality cancelling headphones and is wearing them over his ears. Yan Kyo glances back from the passenger seat. Into the phone quiet it was complete hell. The stream at the campsite flooded and we had to pack up our tents but Da Song just refused to leave. He was crying and yelling sighs we barely got him in the car and now we're on our way. I am counting on the Japagori. It has to be ready. Pale so you're almost here. Eight minutes according to navigation. I see. Eight minutes. Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung are completely aghast. You should start now. You're the best. Yan Kyo hangs up. The family members all look at each other blankly. What the fuck do we do? The living room is still wildly littered with whiskey bottles plates peaches. Chung Sook closes her eyes and takes a deep breath. Quiet what the hell is a Japagori. Look it up. The recipe's online. Ki Wu is completely numb. He's just standing there still out of breath from the fracas when. To Ki Wu what do we do? I don't know. This wasn't part of the plan. They're all standing around when Ki Tech suddenly twists Kun Se's arm. Ki Tech has a manic glow about him. His eyes are bloodshot. Ow. Move. Hurry. At Ki Tech's command the family jump into action. Ki Yung starts clearing the bottles with lightning speed and Ki Tech drags Kun Se toward the basement. Ki Wu roughly pulls up Moon Kwong. Her eyes are heavily swollen like she just went through 10 rounds with Mike Tyson. She coughs incessantly as she is hauled away. Chung Sook is solely focused on the Japagori. She looks up the recipe while putting water on the stove. She rips open two packs of noodles, jajang ramen and instant udon. Ki Tech pushes Kun Se down the stairs into the secret room. He's rough scary. 
and it's not acting. Even in this dire situation Kun Se can't stop his laughing. Laughing nervously you don't have to do this. Let's all sit down and talk. Ki Tech shuts Kun Se up by throwing him on the floor. Ki Tech then looks through the miscellaneous crap in the room and finds a power cord. He is tying Kun Se with it when, Ki Wu rushes down the stairs with Moon Kuang. He also looks for something to tie Moon Kuang with. She's barely breathing and is only half conscious. It'll take care of them. You go and help Ki Yun. Okay. Ki Wu is still numb. He has no focus in his eyes. No longer the man with the plan. He just does as he's told. He hurries up the stairs. Chung Sook methodically lays out the ramen soup packets on the counter and starts cooking the flank steak. Ki Wu comes up from the basement. He runs past her and goes into the where Ki Yung is kicking foods and plates under the furniture. She moves fast with purpose. Ki Wu is looking at her blankly when he hears the Mercedes arriving in the garage. He panics. He sees Da Hei's yellow journal on top of the coffee table and picks it up. He hurries up to the second floor. Chung Sook stirs the noodles with great speed. She soon hears the Park family walking up the garage stairs. Ki Yung stops everything and picks up the remaining peaches. She hides under the large coffee table. A disgruntled Da Song appears first and stalks across the living room. From under the coffee table Ki Yung sees Yan Kyo running after Da Song. She points to the kitchen. Da Song. Look what Chung Sook made. It's Japagori your favorite. Da Song ignores the steaming bowl of Japagori and walks up the stairs. An equally pissed Da Hei comes up behind him and snatches the headphones off his ears. She stomps ahead of him. Ki Wu closes the box of journals and puts the combination lock back on. He quickly hides under the bed. Da Hei walks inside moments later and throws herself on the bed. The bottom of the mattress sinks and nearly touches Ki Wu's nose. Da Hei turns up the volume on her phone. Music escapes from her headphones. Ki Tech finishes tying Kun Se and moves on to Moon Kuang. She's still hyperventilating and her eyes are swollen shut. Ki Tech approaches with the cord when Moon Kuang suddenly gets up and shoves Ki Tech to the side. She runs up the stairs. Ki Tech chases her. Yan Kyo gives up on talking to Da Song. She walks down to the kitchen where Chung Sook is waiting with the Japagori. At the same time Chung Sook sees Moon Kuang running up from the storage basement. With the pot still in her hands she swiftly turns toward the door and, pow! Kicks Moon Kuang in the face. Moon Kuang tumbles down and slams her head hard on one of the steps. Looks like at least a concussion. Ki Tech witnesses the fall from below and gasps. Yan Kyo walks into the kitchen having missed the devastating kick by a mere millisecond. She sits at the dining table. This is ridiculous. You should eat this. Oh thank you. Wait. No. I'll give it to Dong Ik. You put the steak in right. Chung Sook is too worried about Moon Kuang to be annoyed by Yan Kyo's flip-flopping. She looks down at the bottom of stairs where, Moon Kuang lies unconscious with her head rammed into the wall. Ki Tech soon drags her out of sight. Ki Tech pulls Moon Kuang's limp body through the steel door that leads to the secret room. He slides the cabinet back in place to cover the entrance. He sees that Moon Kuang is unconscious and starts panicking. He slaps her in the face. He's relieved when Moon Kuang lets out a weak moan. Ki Tech starts tying her with a cord when he hears a strange noise coming from below. He rushes down the stairs to see, Kun Se arms still tied banging his head against a series of electrical switches on the wall. A truly bizarre sight. What the hell are you doing? Mr. Park is home. This is my welcome home ritual. Above, Kun Se Ki Tech sees a tall open space. The hollow area beneath the garage stairs. We hear Dong I K's footsteps heading up to the living room. Kun Se continues to bang on the switches. Ki Tech sees that the lines from the switches go all the way up to the entrance. What are you staring at? I do this every day. As Dong I K walks up from the garage the lights above him blink one by one in sequence. 
That's when we realized the motion sensor lights that we noticed throughout the film weren't motion sensor lights after all. It was Kun Se's performance welcoming Dong I K home. Babe have some japagori. I put some steak in. Shakes his head no thanks. I am going up to take a shower. Kun Se sings a silly improvised song as he gleefully bangs the switches with his forehead. Singing welcome back what a hard day you must have had at work welcome back Mr. Park we love you so much. Re, lights that sensor as all bonkers. Yan Kyo talks to Chung Sook as she shoves japagori and flank steak in her mouth. She looks up. I guess there are still some things you need to learn about us. You think we're weird right? Slurps ramen we go out of our way to indulge Da Song. Treat him like some kind of crown prince. Not at all. You have to understand. Da Song needs special care. He's not well. We've been helping him with trauma therapy and art therapy. You see he went through a traumatic event when he was little. What kind of? Do you believe in ghosts? Ghosts. When Da Song was in first grade he saw a ghost. Yan Kyo tells the story as she noisily slurps her ramen. Chung Sook's spine tingles. A creepy silence surrounds the kitchen. Ki Yung listens intently from under the coffee table. That year we threw him a big birthday party at home. At night when we were all asleep Da Song snuck back down to the kitchen because he couldn't stop thinking about the cake. You see the fresh cream on that cake was just divine. Right. He was crouched over there in front of the refrigerator eating cake with his fingers when, Chung Sook is riveted. He saw something. Over there. In the living room window. A dark figure. Spooked in the garden. No in the kitchen. Yan Kyo points to the living room window. See. You can see the kitchen reflected in the window. My goodness. He saw a dark figure looking over his shoulders. A ghost. As camera whip pans to the living room window we transition to a. We see the kitchen reflected in the living room window. Da Song is sitting on the floor plowing into his cake. We see a dark figure behind Da Song. The ghost. He just stands there watching Da Song eat. I heard a scream and rushed down the stairs. Tears building when I found him his eyes were rolled back and he was foaming at the mouth shaking uncontrollably. Oh my gosh. Have you seen a child going through a seizure? It's awful. If you don't perform first aid in the first 15 minutes it's over. You have to take him to the hospital as soon as you can. Yan Kyo shakes off the memories and returns to her ditzy self. Dong I K was away on a business trip and I was all by myself. Anyway after that horrible experience we've tried to go away for his birthday every year. Last year we went to my parents' house. This year camping she angrily tosses her noodles. Now it's all gone to crap. I see. Chung Sook realizes who the ghost was but keeps mum. Dong I K doesn't take it seriously. Growing pains he says. And he says living in a haunted house actually brings good fortune. Good for business or something. Slurps ramen you know what though. Business has been very good these past few years. It's funny as Yan Kyo rambles on, camera moves in on Da Song's drawing on the wall. It focuses on the schizophrenia zone we see the dark ambiguous shape drawn in it. The shape which vaguely resembles the ghost match cuts to. Kun Se's dark face staring back at Ki Tech. Ki Tech looks at the numerous notes and drawings covering the walls. He sees photos and magazine interviews of Namgung Hyunja and Dong I K. A record of Kun Se's devolving mind. Ki Tech feels like he's in the twilight zone. God. I can't believe you lived here for so long. I guess you had no choice. Plenty of people live underground. More if you count semi underground apartments. Kun Se laughs. So what was your plan? You didn't even have one, did you? Laughing, I like it here. It almost feels like I grew up here. This might as well be my official address. Kun Se rambles on incoherently his eyes glazed and out of focus. Ki Tech starts getting scared. Please. You have to let me stay here. Ki Tech finds a roll of duct tape among the mess and starts ripping off a piece. Please. Talk to my wife. We don't have to fight. Looking around where did she go? 
She didn't mean what she said. The woman really has a heart of gold. She stood by me the whole time I was in here. Four long years key tech tapes Kun Se's mouth shut. He then goes to stairs and tapes Moon Kwong's mouth as well. As he does he feels something wet behind her head. Blood. Key tech's head spins when he sees the blood on his fingertips. He runs up the stairs. Key tech shuts the steel door and ties the handle with wires. He then pushes the cabinet back in place sealing off the secret doorway. Breathing heavily he looks up at the thin bar of light coming from the kitchen. We're on Ki Woo's stunned face. He is face to face with Juni who is poking his head under the mattress having found Ki Woo. Da He looks down at Juni from the bed. She becomes curious when she sees the dog wagging his tail with his head buried under the bed. She bends over to see what it is when, she hears Yan Kyo walking up the stairs. She immediately springs back up. Picking up Juni she walks out to the. Where she confronts Yan Kyo. You're unbelievable. What? You didn't even ask me. I like Japagori too. Yan Kyo wipes her mouth. I just. Da Song didn't want it so you offered it to Chung Sook. Then you gave it to Dad. Then instead of asking me you decided to eat it all by yourself. What I didn't cross your mind. Da He and Yan Kyo bicker down the hall soon disappearing from our sight. Through Da He's open door we see Ki Woo slowly emerging from under the bed. He checks the hallway before tiptoeing over to the stairs where he sees Chung Sook waving at him from below come down Chung Sook also gestures toward the basement stairs from which Ki Tech carefully walks out. Once they're all together they start toward the. The family quietly crosses the living room toward the garage entrance. They stop. They make a quick detour to the coffee table where Ki Yung is still hiding. They are helping her out from under the table when they suddenly hear footsteps thundering down the stairs. Fast. Ki Yung hides under the table again. Having nowhere to go Ki Wu and Ki Tech also crawl underneath. Chung Sook turns to see, Da Song running down the stairs dressed in a raincoat. He's wearing a backpack and also has the folded teepee strapped across his shoulders. Da Song. Slow down. Dangling all kinds of camping gear over his raincoat Da Song storms through the living room and heads to the garden. He opens the glass door and jumps out into the pouring rain. He then starts building the teepee in the middle of the yard. He's quick efficient. A true scout. Yan Kyo and Dong I K yell at Da Song as they rush down the stairs. Da Song. Are you crazy? Da Song Park. Laughs I can't believe this. Yan Kyo and Dong I K hesitate at the door still in their pajamas. Chung Sook brings two umbrellas and they finally go out. Da Song has already finished setting up the teepee and is now working on the inside. Ki Tek Ki Wu and Ki Yung attempt to make a run while Yan Kyo and Dong I K are outside. They start wiggling their way out when Da He comes running down the stairs. They quickly wiggle back in. English what the fuck is going on here? Da He watches her parents pleading with Da Song in the rain. Pathetic. She shoots a video and sends it to none other than Mr. Kevin aka Ki Wu whose phone vibrates just a few feet from her under the table. Ki Wu quickly silences his phone. Chung Sook coughs to cover the sound. She glances over at Da He to see if Da He heard it too. She did. Da He looks around confused. Ki Wu hurriedly switches his phone to silence mode. Ki Tech and Ki Yung do the same. Da He's text messages crowd Ki Woo's screen, SMH Da Song's crazy raindance I hate my brother totes saw this coming. Started losing his shit at camp. I miss you me too selfie please know why nude I am with you right now Da He continues to exchange cringe inducing love texts with Ki Woo as she plops down on the sofa. Ki Tech Ki Woo and Ki Yung nearly shriek when Da He's wriggly feet come within inches of their faces. Meanwhile Yan Kyo and Dong I K give up on Da Song and return to the living room. Chung Sook takes their umbrellas and hands them a couple of towels. She nervously looks over at the coffee table. To Chung Sook you should go sleep in the room. Well stay here with Da Song. To Da Hei you too. Stop looking at your phone and go to your room. 
without answering Da He gets up and stomps up the stairs never looking up once from her phone. Chung Suk looks back at the living room with a worried face as she goes to the kitchen. Yan Kyo and Dong I K sit down on the sofa now directly facing Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yun. Dong I K presses the button on his walkie talkie. Into the radio dad to Da Song dad to Da Song. Currently standing by in the living room. It'll be here all night so call me if there's an emergency. Copy that. Over and out. Da Song's voice on the radio sounds excited. He got his wish after all. Dong I K lets out a weak laugh. This is incredible. You don't think the teepee will leak do you? Size I bought it directly from an American vendor. I think it should be okay. Your son is quite unpredictable. Never easy ill say. Yan Kyo feels like it's her fault. He's been getting better. Look. Signing him up for the Cub Scouts definitely paid off. See how fast he set up that tent. Outside the window the teepee lights up. Lanterns are lit inside one after another. It's picturesque. The teepee emitting a pleasant orange glow. Against the backdrop of beautiful trees. Seen through the shimmering veil of pouring rain. Dong I K turns off the living room lights and places a few cushions on Yan Kyo's side. Let's just sleep here on the sofa tonight. We'll be able to see the tent from here. That sounds good. That way we can keep an eye on Da Song. Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung turn ashen. They're fucked. Dong I K lies down in the spooning position behind Yan Kyo. It's quite romantic. Both of them in their pajamas. Tightly snuggled up on the sofa. Hold on. Sniffs I know that smell. What? This is Mr. Kim's smell. Mr. Kim. Are you sure? Sniffs I don't know what you're talking about. Dong I K and Yan Kyo both sniff the air. Ki Tech becomes nervous. He smells his t-shirt. I guess you don't know. I sit behind him every day so I know the smell. Like poor people smell. No. It's not that strong. It's more like a subtle aroma that seeps into the air. Like old people smell. No no. How should I put it maybe the smell of an old radish pickle. Or that smell when you're washing a dirty rag. Keytech tries his best to keep a straight face under the table. I mean I like his driving. And the man never crosses the line. Sometimes he teeters very close but he never actually crosses it. That's all great. But that smell. It definitely crosses the line. Laughs it just creeps into the backseat and surrounds you. You think that's what Da Song was talking about. It's hard to explain. I smell it when I ride the subway sometimes. I haven't ridden the subway in forever. There's this unique smell that subway commuters have Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yun can do nothing but silently take hit after hit. Ki Tech is completely expressionless. On the sofa Dong I K slowly slides up his hand and caresses Yan Kyo's breasts over her pajama top. Quiet what are you doing? It feels like we're in the backseat of a car doesn't it? Dong I K sounds like a horny high school boy. He puts his hand inside Yan Kyo's pajama top and continues fondling her. Yan Kyo looks up at the kitchen and the stairs to make sure no one is watching. She closes her eyes and gives in to pleasure. Moaning clockwise. Dong I K moves his hand as instructed. It starts migrating below Yan Kyo's navel. Their bodies grow closer. Breathing becomes labored. Do you have a pair of really cheap panties? Cheap panties. Those panties that Yun left behind. Something like that. Real cheap and tacky. Dong I K's hand slips inside Yan Kyo's underwear. He makes it vibrate like a sex toy. Yan Kyo's lips part from pleasure. She gasps. No I don't have something so crude. I must be a pervert. I get hard thinking about those cheap trashy pair of underpants. Where would I find something so horrendous? Gasps down. Ki Yung tries to keep a cool face as the rich couple continue to malign her underwear. Ki Tech's face is dark. He's more humiliated than she is. Meanwhile Yan Kyo is pushed closer toward climax by the underpants talk. She bites her lips but is hardly able to suppress her moans. 
Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung hear everything under the table. A heavy fatigue comes over Ki Tech's face. Time passes slowly. Hiding in the dark kitchen Chung Suk looks over at the living room where the Parks are now sleeping. She sends a text, they're passed out move out one by one under the table Ki Tech receives the text. He signals Ki Yung to go first. She slides out and starts crawling toward the garage stairs. Ki Wu goes next. Once they are safely across they wait for Ki Tech. Ki Tech is slowly making his way when, a strong beam of light suddenly penetrates the living room. A flashlight. Ki Tech quickly flattens himself on the floor. The light searches the living room before settling on Yan Kyo and Dong I K on the sofa. The rain is still heavy. We see Da Song poking his head out shining his flashlight at Yan Kyo and Dong I K in the living room. He turns glum when he sees them sleeping. He angrily waves the flashlight trying to wake them up. Ki Tech curls into a tight ball to avoid the wildly roaming light. He is slowly inching toward the stairs when, the T-667 walkie-talkie on the coffee table crackles to life. We hear Da Song's voice through the fuzz. Mayday. Mayday. Dad come in. Ki Tech freezes. There's nowhere to hide. He can only close his eyes and hope he doesn't get discovered. Dong I K wakes up and picks up the walkie-talkie. He looks out the window and sees the flashlight blinking inside the tent. Into the radio what is it? Is that Da Song? What's going on? Yan Kyo and Dong I K are too concerned with Da Song to notice Ki Tech hunched over in the dark merely a few feet away. I can't go to sleep. Over. Dong I K and Yan Kyo can't help but laugh. Into the radio so come inside. Let's all go to sleep in our comfy beds. No. The transmission cuts out. Dong I K and Yan Kyo laugh and sigh. Back to the sofa it is. They return to sleep. When all is quiet Ki Tech starts moving again. Ki Tech flips up the door switch before quickly flipping it back down. The garage door goes up about one and a half feet before stopping. Ki Yung and Ki Wu hold their breath. Did anyone in the house hear the door? When they don't hear anything they crawl through the narrow opening and walk out into the rain. Ki Tech presses the down switch and slips through the crack before it completely closes. High on the surveillance camera above the gate the severed wires dangling below. Rack focus to reveal, Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung sneaking out of the house and walking down the empty road. Rain pours as they make their way down the winding road. Ki Tech and the kids trudge silently through the rain. They're walking on the side of a gloomy four-lane road no longer in the nice part of town. They don't bother going into a store to buy an umbrella. They don't bother hailing a cab. They just walk their faces steeped in anguish. We look down on a hillside neighborhood. A different hillside view. Working class. Illuminated by the lights of low-income apartments. The gates of poverty. Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung stop under an overpass out of breath. We see them as silhouettes. Panting so what did you do? What are you talking about? The basement. I tied them up so they can't come out. What are we going to do? Ki Tech is silent. What do we do now? What's the goddamn plan? Ki Tech doesn't have one. Rain drowns the silence. Ki Wu still in a daze mumbles to himself. What would Min Hyuk do? Min Hyuk wouldn't have gotten himself in this mess in the first place. Ki Yung is about to lash out further when Ki Tech calmly steps forward. Calm down. Both of you. Ki Yung seethes. We made it out of that house didn't we? We did. No one else knows about what happened in the house. Am I right? Ki Yung nods. So as far as I am concerned nothing happened in there. Do you understand? Ki Tech sounds like a real father. Firm. Reassuring. Ki Yung actually listens to him. I know what I am doing. Daddy has a plan. So you two just erase everything that happened today from your memory. Okay. Ki Wu nods. Let's go home and wash up. With that Ki Tech steps back into the rain. Ki Wu and Ki Yung follow. Unsettling music creeps in over the rain. 
Ki Tech Ki Wu and Ki Yung walk through the relentless downpour passing shabby low rent buildings. They hear shouting sirens in the distance. They turn the corner to see a completely flooded alley. All the roads leading to their apartment are covered in knee deep water. Total pandemonium. Sewage backflows. A semi basement resident scoops water out of his apartment with a bucket. Ki Tech stares in horror. He hurries toward the apartment. Ki Wu and Ki Yung splash in after him. Ki Tech has to use great strength to open the door. He steps inside to see brown flood water pouring in through the window. The water is already up to his chest. His foot touches something and he reaches into the dirty water to pick up a live king crab flailing its legs. Ki Tech stares at the crab. It's too surreal. His home has become an underwater habitat. He throws the crab away. His face fills with despair. Meanwhile Ki Wu crosses toward the window. He tries to close it to stop further flooding when. Ow. He feels a shock of electricity as soon as he touches it. He quickly withdraws his hand. Were you shocked? Don't touch it. Don't touch the windows. Just get what you need. Ki Yung pries the door open and trudges toward the toilet which is spewing shit water like an Icelandic geyser. Ki Yung barely closes the lid and climbs on top. She opens a square panel on the ceiling and reaches in to find a pack of cigarettes and a lighter that she had hidden there. We see a few folded bills stashed in the cellophane wrap. Ki Yung lights a cigarette amidst the raging flood. The surging sewage lifts her toilet seat up and down. Ki Wu is going around packing a few essentials into a gray bag when, something touches his foot in the water. He bends over and reaches into the murky depths eventually finding, the viewing stone that Min Hyuk gave the family as a gift. Ki Wu pants heavily as he hugs the rock. It's like he just found a precious treasure. Over the image of the stone veiled by the hazy undulating water dark music begins to play. Kun Se is facing away from Moon Kwong straining to remove the tape off her mouth with his tied up hands. Moon Kwong sweats profusely and falls in and out of consciousness. When Kun Se finally rips off the tape, Moon Kwong jumps up and staggers toward the toilet. Kun Se watches in horror as she throws up into the bowl. Through tape mm. Moon Kwong Moon Kwong moans. She's in a lot of pain. She gets up and starts toward Kun Se but loses her balance. Kun Se throws himself to catch her but she falls flat on the floor. Vomiting is a symptom of Kun Se screams something to Moon Kwong but his cries are muffled by the tape on his mouth. They're heard as primal animalistic grunts. It's supposed to be a symptom of Kun Se stares helplessly. Weak honey laughs Chung Sook. She that bitch kicked me in the face Moon Kwong laughs like her husband mumbling incoherently. Her voice dwindles. She's near the end. She curls up in the corner next to the toilet. Kun Se shouts through the tape. He wails painfully like a hurt beast. The scream continues over too. The water is now up to Ki Tech's chin. He stands at the entrance and looks back at the apartment like a captain taking one last look at his sinking ship. The water inside has merged with the floodwater on the street and has formed a continuous brown ocean extending throughout the neighborhood. Unnerving music continues. A dark wave of water rolls over the screen and we cut to. Inside the dark room we find a crazed Kun Se banging on the wall switches with his bloody forehead. His face is a mask of sweat blood snot. We see Moon Kwong's lifeless body on the floor behind him. Kun Se furiously bangs the switches with his head overcome with pain and sorrow. Da Song unzips the tent and looks at the living room across the garden. He sees the lights blinking randomly in the front entrance. He starts timing the blinks. He takes out his notebook and starts transcribing them as dots and dashes. He consults the Morse code chart in the back of his Cub Scout book but can't seem to make out any words. Camera tracks in on the lights as they blink more and more frantically. Unsettling music reaches a crescendo. Filled with rows and rows of evacuees from flooded areas. Currently sleeping. The lights are off and the gym is illuminated by the faint glow of daybreak. Ki Tech and the kids are among the evacuees. Ki Yung is completely knocked out. It's been a rough night. Ki Wu tightly holds the viewing stone as he lies wide awake. 
His eyes are bloodshot. Hey dad. Hey. So Ki Wu looks at Ki Yun to make sure she is sleeping. Your plan. What is it? What are you talking about? You said you had a plan. What are we going to do about quiet the basement? Ki Tech is silent for a long moment. His face is cold and emotionless. Do you want to know how you make a foolproof plan? How? Don't plan at all. Have no plan. Ki Wu confused. If you plan something will always go wrong. That's life. Then look around. Do you think these people got up this morning and said tonight I am going to sleep on a dirty floor with hundreds of strangers. But look where they are now. Look where we are. Ki Wu is hardly consoled. That's why you should never plan. If you don't have a plan you can't fail. You can't do anything wrong. Doesn't matter if you kill someone or commit fucking treason. Nothing fucking matters. You understand. Ki Tech talks quietly. There's a hostility in his voice. His face drips with fatigue. Ki Wu is scared. He's never seen his father like this. He hugs the rock more tightly. I am sorry dad. For what? Everything. I am going to make it right. Stop talking nonsense. Re, viewing stone why are you hugging that thing? This. Ki Wu looks down at the stone. It wants to be with me. Ki Tech looks at Ki Wu. He's acting strange. It's true. It keeps following me. Get some sleep. To himself I knew it was a sign when Min Hyuk gave it to me. A symbolic gift. Ki Wu stares blankly ahead. We have no idea what he's thinking. Sunlight fills the living room. Yan Kyo walks up to the window and looks up at the marvelous sky. She sees the tent in the garden. Dong I K slowly rises from the sofa behind her. Dong I K walks over to the raindrop covered teepee and carefully peeks inside. Da Song is finally asleep after the long and eventful night. Dong I K smiles and gives the OK sign to Yan Kyo in the living room. Into the phone, Jessica. Sorry to call you so early on a Sunday. Are you free for lunch today? We're planning a surprise party for Da Song. Yan Kyo is sitting at her vanity chatting excitedly into her phone. It's on speaker. A groggy Ki Yung answers the phone. We see rows of people sleeping behind her. Into the phone you're having a birthday party. Yes. Da Song would be so thrilled to see you there. Into the phone the food will be amazing. Pasta gratin salmon steak. You know I am an excellent chef right? You have to come. Sure. Into the phone you have to be here by 1 o'clock at the latest. And well count today as a lesson. English you know what I mean. Korean see you very soon. Yan Kyo lays down a barrage before abruptly hanging up. We see Da He standing behind Yan Kyo. She looks over her mom's shoulders with twinkling eyes. Hey mom. The birthday party should I invite Kevin? Turning back what an excellent idea. Why not? You call him. On it. Da He ecstatic runs to her room. As she does, we see Dong I K coming up the stairs behind her. He walks into the master bedroom and throws himself on the bed. He crawls under the covers to go back to sleep. Yan Kyo calls him from the dressing room. Sleep sleep. You had a long night. You need some more rest. Thanks. Yans don't you have to do the rounds. Yep. Wine shop bakery florist grocery store I am on top of it. I already called Mr. Kim and told him to come early. I am going to pay him extra for today. Perfect. Dong I K gives her a thumbs up with his eyes closed. Yan Kyo smiles pleased with Dong I K's approval. She opens the closet. Evacuees surround a pile of second-hand clothes looking for something salvageable. Donations from a local organization. Ki Yun looks frustrated. She doesn't see anything appropriate for the party. She looks at Ki Tech who is also frantically digging through the pile with bloodshot eyes. Behind them Ki Wu is still lying on the floor. He opens his eyes and looks at his phone. Seven missed calls. Da Hei Ki Wu sits up and goes through Da Hei's text messages. He puts the viewing stone in the gray bag. Chung Suk busily prepares ingredients for the party. Her eyes are red. 
She hasn't slept at all. A refreshed Yan Kyo hops down the stairs and calls Chung Suk out to the living room. She looks out at the sunny garden. I want you to go to the storage basement. We should have about 10 party tables in there. Okay. Let's bring them all out. Clean them so they're bright and shiny. Well set them up in a semicircle around Da Song's tent Yan Kyo tries to show Chung Suk with her hands. No not quite right. Then. Crane formation. You know right. The formation that General Yi Soon Shin famously used during the Battle of Hansen Island. Chung Suk's face says how the fuck should I know she quickly hides her expression. Think of Da Song's tent as a Japanese battleship. Well surround it in a semicircle like the wings of a crane. The barbecue grill will go next to the tent. Chung Suk struggles to pull out the party tables from the faintly lit basement. She stops to take a breath. A chilling silence envelops the room. Chung Suk looks at the jar cabinet covering the secret door. She can almost hear Moon Kwong and Kun Se's breathing coming from the other side. She stares at the cabinet for a long time. An upscale food market. Organic produce beautifully displayed. Key Tech is at the cash register bagging items as a cashier scans them. Yan Kyo is next to him talking on the phone. Laughing that sounds great. Bring your husband too. And please, don't bring any gifts. Yan Kyo hands the cashier her credit card. I just want you to come and enjoy the food. It seems like it's going to be a large-scale affair. Key Tech follows Yan Kyo out with huge bags of fruits and vegetables. Yan Kyo's shrill laughter puts Key Tech on edge. He squints his bloodshot eyes. Into the phone come. You can take a break from cooking today. Nodding yes of course. Daytime is the best time for Vino. Laughs well we'd be so grateful if you could sing a song at the party. Into the phone no dress code. It's just a casual affair. You can come in your pajamas if you want. Laughs and please no gifts. I just want you to come and enjoy. That'll be the best gift for us. Then you have a mini Cooper right? Great. We can squeeze it in next to our car. It'll fit just fine. Yan Kyo talks on the phone as she walks past fancy vintage wines. She picks several out and gives them to Ki Tech. Ki Tech's face grows dark as he follows Yan Kyo with the heavy basket. Chung Suk is setting up the tables in the crane formation around the tent. Da Song is still sleeping inside. She is sweating and grunting away by herself when she sees a pajama clad Dong I K walking toward the tent. He smiles awkwardly at Chung Suk before checking inside the tent. He turns to Chung Suk and puts a finger on his lips, shish. Silent he's still sleeping. Chung Suk nods and proceeds quietly. It's hard to set up the bulky tables without making noise. Dong I K scratches his belly as he returns to the house. Into the phone did you see the sky today? Crystal clear. Zero air pollution. Rain washed it all away. Of course camping was a major fail because of the rain but we get to have a garden party instead yay. It was actually a blessing in disguise. Yan Kyo is jabbering away when she suddenly smells something and holds her nose. Ki Tech's scent must have drifted her way. Ki Tech sees Yan Kyo covering her nose through the rearview mirror. It bothers him. Yan Kyo rolls down the window slightly. I almost forgot. Please 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 don't bring any presents. You have to promise. The sun shines brightly on the garden. Party guests sit around tables decorated with flowers. Chung Suk busily shuttles food from the kitchen. Some of the guests have already finished the bottles of wine at their table. People are having a good time. We see the party downstairs through Da Hei's window. Colorful gift boxes are stacked high in front of Da Song's teepee. Ki Wu looks out the window with a blank expression. Da He stands beside him staring. You were somewhere else weren't you? What? When we were kissing just now. You were somewhere else. Right. No. Stop lying. You're still thinking about something else. Ki Wu sees the crowd mingling effortlessly in the garden. 
a kid taking pictures with his Leica a woman passionately explaining something to other guests with a bottle of wine in her hand a male guest chopping firewood next to the grill and looking utterly cool doing it. Everyone looks genuinely happy. Re, guests there also gorgeous. Even though they had to come at the last minute. So cool. Laid back. Da Hey looks puzzled. Da Hey. Yeah. Do I look like I belong here? What do you mean? Do I look like I belong in this house? Da Hey has no idea why he's asking. Ki Wu still numb pads over to the desk where his bag is. Where are you going? I need to go downstairs. Stay. Let's hang out. I need to go down. Those people are boring. Da Hei hugs Ki Wu tightly. Just stay with me. Sato not there. Further down. With a grim face Ki Wu removes the suiseki from his bag. Whoa. What is that thing? Dong I K and Ki Tech hide behind the trees where the guests can't see them dressed as Native Americans. Dong I K puts feathers and other finishing touches on Ki Tech's costume. I can't believe we're doing this. Look at us. A couple of middle-aged men wearing silly costumes. It's fine. Dong I K and Ki Tech both laugh awkwardly. Ki Tech looks exhausted. It's been a non-stop shitshow since yesterday, the flood the evacuation center spending the morning as Yan Kyo's shopping assistant and now the elaborate role-playing. He just stands there limply holding the toy axe. I am really sorry Mr. Kim. Mrs. Park made me do this. I didn't have a choice. Then it's really simple. There's going to be a cake ceremony and Jessica the art teacher is going to bring out the cake. She's walking 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 she's going to present the cake then we appear from the trees swinging our axes ambushing her. Because you know we're the bad guys. Sure. At that moment Da Song the good Indian attacks us with his axe. A battle ensues and Da Song heroically saves Ms. Jessica and the cake. Everybody applauds. You get the idea. I know it's ridiculous. Dong I K laughs again. I guess Mrs. Park enjoys throwing parties. I suppose she does. She put a lot of effort into Da Song's birthday this year. How thoughtful of her. And you too. Dong I K senses a tone in Ki Tech's voice. What can you do I guess? You love them right? Ki Tech doesn't hide the sarcasm and Dong I K notices. Tension rises between them. Mr. Kim you're technically working today aren't you? Yes sir. Then just think of this as part of the job. Dong I K avoids Ki Tech's eyes as he puts another feather on Ki Tech's headband. Mr. Park. I think you went over the line. What did you say? No. I mean this. Dong I K sees that one of the feathers was pushed too far. The tip is poking out from the bottom of the headband. He still can't shake the feeling that Ki Tech was talking about a different line. Ki Tech pushes up the errant feather with his finger. Chung Sook sets up the buffet table according to Yan Kyo's reference picture. A foreign chef is behind her marinating barbecue meat. When he finishes and takes the meat out to the garden, Ki Yun carefully approaches Chung Sook, whispering have you been down there? No I've been too busy. Shouldn't we try to talk to them? Try to reach an agreement? I think so too. We all got too emotional yesterday. Ki Yun looks around before saying, I'll go down there and see how they're doing. Chung Sook nods. From under the table she takes out a large party platter filled with various foods. Here. Take this with you. I made it for them just in case. They'll be more willing to talk if their stomachs are full. Ki Yung nods. She takes the platter and adds a few more meatballs from the buffet table. She is about to go down to the basement when, she hears Yan Kyo's high-pitched laughter coming from the living room. Jessica. I was looking for you. What are you doing there? Come out here. Ki Yung slowly puts the platter down behind her. Chung Sook quickly escapes taking more food out to the garden. Yan Kyo comes in and pulls Ki Yung out to the where she shows Ki Yung a gourmet cream cake sitting on the coffee table. This cake is very symbolic. It has a therapeutic significance you know related to Da Song's trauma. I want you to bring it out Jessica. 
It has to be you. It'll be the highlight of the day. As Yan Kyo and Ki Yung admire the cake, we see Ki Wu quietly walking down the stairs out of focus in the background. He has the gray bag over his shoulder. He enters the kitchen and walks down to the storage basement. Ki Wu pushes the jar cabinet to the side revealing the dark steel door behind it. He unties the tightly wrapped wires and opens the door. He walks down one step at a time holding up his cell phone flashlight. The room is pitch black. Once he reaches the bottom of the stairs Ki Wu removes the viewing stone from the gray bag. His hands tremble and he starts breathing faster. With his cell phone flashlight tucked in his breast pocket he carefully makes his way in eventually finding, a tied up Moon Kwong fallen next to the toilet. Ki Wu swallows nervously. His legs grow weak and his eyes brim with tears as he slowly walks up to Moon Kwong's head. He raises the stone to strike Moon Kwong but, he can't do it. He just stands there face covered in snot and tears shaking uncontrollably when, we notice a circular object floating behind Ki Wu. A noose. Kun Se has untied his cord and formed a noose with it. He slowly brings it above Ki Wu's head. Ki Wu is oblivious. He continues to sob and shudder. He finally feels something behind him and looks up but, too late. Kun Se quickly wraps the noose around Ki Wu's neck and tightens it. Ki Wu struggles. The viewing stone drops and hits his foot which causes him to further lose his balance. He is dragged across the floor by Kun Se. We can only see Kun Se's maniacal eyes in the darkness as he strangles Ki Wu. Ki Wu thrashes violently. He can't breathe and his eyes are ready to roll back. Kun Se picks up the viewing stone and raises it to deliver the final blow. He swings it mightily at Ki Wu's head but, Ki Wu turns and avoids it at the last moment. Ki Wu runs up the stairs cord still dangling from his neck. Kun Se chases Ki Wu with the stone. Ki Wu has just made it past the jar cabinet when, Kun Se grabs the cord dragging behind Ki Wu and pulls it hard. Ki Wu flies backward into the air and, slam falls hard on the floor. His wind is knocked out. Kun Se runs up to Ki Wu. He raises the stone high and brings it down on Ki Wu's head. We hear a horrifying crunch as we. We hear applause. One of the party guests an opera singer starts singing an aria. Ki Yung is holding the cake. Yan Kyo lights the candles. A thirsty Kun Se gulps down a large bottle of plum extract. He pushes the cabinet back in place and hides the secret doorway. He hears the faint sound of Arya coming from above. When he turns we finally see his face, it's horrible. And a little ridiculous. Blood from his forehead has dried into a frightening red mask. But a clear rectangle remains where the tape covered his mouth. Kun Se looks down at his feet where Ki Wu is lying. Blood is slowly pooling around Ki Wu's head pushing out the puddles of plum extract spilled on the floor. Kun Se picks up the viewing stone from the floor and slams Ki Wu's head again. Ki Wu's fingers tremble. Is he still conscious? Or was that the last flicker of life? Kun Se trudges up the stairs and arrives in the bright kitchen. A surreal juxtaposition. His ghostly blood smeared mask against the pure white kitchen. Out in the garden he sees through laughing and applauding party guests, Ki Yung holding Da Song's birthday cake. Kun Se picks up a large kitchen knife from the sink and walks toward the garden. As soon as he disappears, Da He comes down the stairs and pokes her head inside the kitchen. Kevin. Kevin where are you? Ki Yung walks down the aisle between the party guests slowly so the candles don't blow out. An embarrassed but obviously excited Da Song waits in front of the tent. He watches his favorite teacher Ms. Jessica bringing him the cake when, everyone screams and the crowd parts like the Red Sea. Ki Yung looks back to see, Kun Se running toward her with the kitchen knife. Ki Yung shoves the cake in Kun Se's face just as he swings the knife. But a beat too late as the knife plunges into her chest. Kun Se pulls the knife and blood plumes from Ki Yung's chest. It sprays over the white cream covering exactly half of Kun Se's face. When Ki Yung falls Da Song sees Kun Se looming over him dripping with Jessica's blood. The ghost. Da Song screams. A truly horrible scream. Louder and two octaves higher than the guests. 
His eyes roll back and he goes into a full-on seizure. We hear Yan Kyo scream from somewhere in the crowd. Kun Se pulls up Ki Yung and puts the knife to her throat. He shouts to the guests. Don't move. Ki Tek and Dong I K are running out from the trees when they stop at Kun Se's voice. The chaotically fleeing guests also freeze in their tracks. A tense moment. A white butterfly flies over to Kun Se and flutters its wings above his cake-covered head. Chung Sook. Where are you? Come out you fucking bitch. Chung Sook emerges from behind the crowd. Her eyes are set on Ki Yung. Ki Yung. Wake up. Ki Yung is bleeding profusely. She lets out a weak moan. Screaming put pressure on the wound Ki Yung. You have to stop the blood. Chung Sook and Ki Tech are focused on Ki Yung while Dong I K and Yan Kyo can't look away from Da Song. An agonizing moment for both families. No one moves until, Kun Se throws Ki Yung on the ground and makes a dash for Chung Sook. People scream scatter. Chung Sook turns the grill over spilling charred meat and firewood over Kun Se. Smoke creates a temporary screen. When Kun Se comes through the smoke Chung Sook quickly snatches his wrist pulling him into a vicious fight. Ki Tech heaves his toy axe at Kun Se as he runs toward the fight. It misses Kun Se and instead bounces off Chung Sook's head. Meanwhile Dong I K jumps over the wounded Ki Yung and sprints toward Da Song. He picks up the spasming child and runs back through the crowd toward Yan Kyo. Chung Sook and Kun Se go at each other in the middle of the garden like two predators. Ki Tech comes to help but can't find a way to squeeze between them. He goes to Ki Yung and tries to staunch the blood. It won't stop. He looks for something to tie her with but there's nothing around. Everyone is busy fleeing and no one stops to help. Help. Please help us. Dong I K gives Da Song to Yan Kyo who barks furiously at Ki Tech. Mr. Kim get the car. We can't wait for an ambulance. Kim. Get the car. Fifteen minutes. Dong I K and Yan Kyo scream frantically at Ki Tech as he desperately tries to stop the blood from Ki Yung's wound. Yan Kyo has a crazed look. Her maternal instinct has been kicked up to eleven. She doesn't care that Ki Yung is dying or that two deranged people are fighting in her garden. Dong I K can't wait anymore. He yells at Ki Tech. Keys. Give me the keys. At that moment, we see the hell breaking loose in the garden in slow motion. Party guests continue to escape one by one and only the little people are left viciously fighting for their lives. He sees his daughter's blood dripping between his fingers. His wife flailing under a man with a knife. Dong I K and Yan Kyo yelling at him. Party guests running away. To add to the list of completely fucked up shit he sees, Da Hei walking toward the gate with a bloody and unconscious Ki Wu on her back. Bawling her eyes out. Meanwhile Dong I K continues to yell at Ki Tech. The keys. Ki Tech removes the car keys from his pocket and hastily throws them at Dong I K. They hit one of the fleeing guests and drop in the grass. Kun Se and Chung Sook roll over the keys as they continue their death match. Kun Se picks up the fallen kitchen knife and stabs Chung Sook in the arm. Chung Sook grabs her arm as she falls into a pile of burning logs behind her. She screams. Kun Se is not done. He climbs on top of her and raises the knife to finish her off. Ki Tech jumps at Kun Se to stop him but Kun Se is too strong. His rage has endowed him with supernatural strength. He quickly subdues Ki Tech and brings the knife up to stab him. Ki Tech closes his eyes. He braces himself for the final moment when, nothing happens. Ki Tech slowly opens his eyes. He sees, a metal barbecue skewer deeply plunged into Kun Se's waist. Kun Se can't even scream. The pain of the hot skewer piercing his innards is too much. We see Chung Sook holding the other end. In between we see pieces of meat and sausage smoking on the skewer. As Chung Sook lets go, Kun Se gradually crumbles to the ground. Ki Tech's crazed red eyes see Dong I K running toward him. Dong I K lifts Chung Sook and searches underneath for the car keys. No longer the cool poised CEO. He's overcome with fear panic. 
He rolls over Kunsei and finally locates the keys when, he smells something and frowns. It's Kunsei's body odor. He holds his nose at the awful smell. Key Tech notices. A fleeting moment but it triggers something inside him. Key Tech picks up the toy axe from the ground and stalks Dong Ik. When Dong Ik hears Key Tech's footsteps and turns around, Key Tech swings the axe and plants it right between Dong Ik's neck and shoulder. That's when we realize it's not a toy, it's a real axe. The one the cool guy used to chop firewood for the barbecue. We're not sure if Key Tech knew it. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that it's stuck deeply in Dong Ik's neck. Yan Kyo and the party guests are too stunned to scream. Blood spurts from Dong Ik's neck as he falls on the grass. Key Tech stares blankly at Dong Ik. He feels something touch his foot and looks down, it's Da Song's toy axe. The real axe is still in his hands dripping with Dong Ik's blood. Yan Kyo faints with Da Song in her arms. Everyone in the garden stops and stares at Key Tech the axe murderer in horror. Key Tech wakes up from his daze and realizes what he's done. He's horrified. He bolts for the gate. When frightened guests jump out of his way he realizes that he still has the bloody axe. He throws it away. Key Tech is scared. As he runs to the gate he sees, Chung Sook pressing down Ki Yung's chest while fighting through her own pain. The foreign chef is beside her bandaging her arm. Kun Se bleeding out from his punctured waist alone and neglected by the crowd. A few men trying to staunch Dong I K's blood while calling. Women helping up Yan Kyo and Da Song. Ki Tech leaves the chaos behind and runs out of the gate. As sirens grow louder in the distance we. The screen is pitch black. We start hearing faint sounds before slowly fading in on, a man staring into the camera. He was the first person I saw when I woke up a month later. We realize this is Ki Wu's Pa. He narrates in a calm voice. The man has a nondescript face and narrow shoulders. He is talking but we can't hear anything. A detective. Although he didn't look like one. When we focus on the mont's mouth we can sort of read his lips. You have the right to remain silent the man seems to be reading Ki Wu his Miranda rights. Reveal, Ki Wu lying on the bed his head heavily bandaged. He flashes a languid smile his eyes droopy. Then I saw a doctor who didn't look like a doctor. He told me one of the side effects of brain surgery was laughing for no reason. A quirky looking doctor examines Ki Wu's pupils. Everything seems like a dream to Ki Wu whose left eye is slightly crossed possibly as a result of nerve damage during surgery. Maybe that's why I laughed when I heard that Ki Yung died. They said she died from loss of blood. Ki Wu chuckles and grabs his stomach as he pushes an IV pole down the hall. The guards look at him strangely. I also laughed when mom and I received our sentences. We avoided the slew of charges they threw at us, forgery home invasion voluntary manslaughter which we argued was self-defense, and walked away with probation. Ki Wu can't stop giggling as the judge hands down his sentence. Chung Sook and his lawyer give him a look. Chung Sook and Ki Wu bounce in their seats as the bus speeds away from the city. They look out at the sunny view. Same when I saw Ki Yung again for the first time since the incident. Countless white urns line the shelves. We see Ki Yung's picture on one of them. I laughed then too. Ki Wu is in front of Ki Yung's urn. He stares at his sister's brightly smiling face in the picture. He smiles back. Chung Sook is sobbing behind him. The picture must be a few years old. Ki Yung is brighter happier in it. More innocent. Everything is just as Ki Yung left it. Chung Sook is on the floor scrubbing the remaining mud stains off the furniture. The camera soon leaves her and moves to the where Ki Wu is sitting on the toilet. He's watching a Monthold news clip on his phone. A reporter is in the news studio talking about the Park House incident. The murders which had no apparent motive and took place in a quiet upper-class neighborhood have confounded the police. The other suspect an unidentified homeless male was murdered himself at the scene further shrouding Ki Wu flips to another news clip. Another reporter appears. 
The driver Kim was known to have a good relationship with his employer Park and police have yet to narrow down a concrete motive. Kim's whereabouts are still unclear after he was last seen fleeing the scene and police continue searching for leads. His cell signal was last active at the crime scene. Of course neither mom or I have had any contact with you since that day. Ki Woo is going around different apartments posting promotional flyers. His new job. We see the detective from the hospital following him from afar. The detective is watching Ki Woo from a staircase when he twists his ankle and falls down the steps. Ki Woo sees the detective fall. He feels bad for the guy. I just feel awful those poor detectives who have to follow us all day. It's winter now. Ki Woo bundled in a parka climbs a hill in the middle of Seoul walking through gray leafless trees. His breath mists in the air. I did have a strong feeling about where you might be. When he's climbed high enough Ki Woo plops down on a rock. He removes a large telescope from his bag. So when the season changed and the news slowed down, and when the detectives finally stopped trailing us, I started climbing the mountain. We see the magnified view of the park mansion and the garden. You can see the house pretty well from there. Through the living room window we see a family laughing and talking. Not the parks. A Caucasian family. From the image of the happy foreign family. Ki Woo shivering in the cold still looking through the telescope. It's dark now. I don't know why but that day I just felt like staying longer. The family members have gone to their rooms to sleep and the living room is empty. There's no movement until, the motion sensor lights in the entrance start blinking. It blinks at varied intervals. Long then short. Short then long. We see Ki Woo's eye grow wide through the telescope lens. He studies the timing of the blinks which don't seem completely random. There's a pattern. Could it be Morse code? Ki Woo starts recording into his cell phone. Dash. Dot. Dash dash wind howls as Ki Woo continues to rattle off dots and dashes with a trembling voice. Ki Woo is on the last train of the night listening to the recording he made earlier through his earphones. He uses a permanent marker to transcribe the dots and dashes on a paper prescription bag. When he runs out of room he writes on his flyers. When he runs out of room there he starts writing on his jeans. The woman sitting next to him looks at him like he's a crazy person. Ki Woo opens a Morse code chart on his cell phone. He stops the playback. He starts deciphering the codes. Dots and dashes soon become words, dear son. And the words turn into Ki Tech's voiceover. Dear son. Perhaps you if no one else will be able to read this letter we see Ki Tech sitting at a desk in the dark chamber. On the desk is a densely written letter which he's translating into Morse code. He consults a faded Morse code chart that Kun Se put up above the desk. You were a boy scout so I am hoping this will somehow reach you. Ki Tech looks thinner and has grown a full beard. He writes thoughtfully one word at a time. How is your health? Your mother I am not too worried about. I am sure she's healthy as an ox. Then I am doing well too. Although I cry often when I think of Ki Yung. Images from the fateful day appear in flashes, blood spurting from Ki Yung's chest. Kun Se's face covered in cake and blood. The axe silently coming down on Dong I K's shoulder. Ki Tech's hand gripping the bloody axe. I still can't believe what happened that day. It almost feels like a dream. Then we switch to Ki Tech's running paw. People screaming running away. The gate approaching ahead. I knew as soon as I ran out of that gate where I had to go. Slow motion of Ki Tech running down the stairs in front of the gate. He sees the front of a Mini Cooper jutting out of the half-open garage. They were able to squeeze the car in but not able to fully close the door. Ki Tech ducks through the opening and enters the garage. A few party guests roam the street in panic but they're too stricken with terror to notice. Only the non-functional surveillance camera looks down at Ki Tech as he slips through the door. Ki Tech pokes his head out from the garage stairs and looks inside the living room. It's empty. Through the window he sees terrified party guests stampeding toward the sound of the ambulance. Holding his shoes in his hands Ki Tech quickly crosses to the kitchen and rushes down to the storage basement. 
Even in the complete madness I had the foresight to grab some water and food Key Tech picks up a box of canned tuna and a box of Evian. He takes care to avoid the blood and plum extract on the floor as he walks across the basement. He pushes the jar cabinet to the side and opens the steel door behind it. He steps inside and closes the door. As he turns the crank handle and seals himself inside the darkness. When we fade back in we see an emptied out mansion lit only by moonlight. The parks have moved out. I realized only later that a house with such a morbid history would not be appealing to potential buyers. I would have to stay in an empty house for a long time. We go from room to room until we arrive in the Key Tech picks at a can of tuna using Kun Se's fork. He eats one tiny piece at a time conserving what limited food he has. All the while he stares across the room where in the darkness. Moon Kwong is curled up next to the toilet. One good thing about being alone was that I was finally able to give her a proper funeral. Moon Kwong's hefty body is thrown into a dirt hole. We see Key Tech panting at the mouth of the hole exhausted from moving her all the way from the basement. The hole is dug in front of a large tree. One scoop at a time dirt is scattered over Moon Kwong's face. Key Tech stops shoveling and takes a break. He leans on the tree and looks up at the stars twinkling above. Tree burials are all the rage these days so I guess no one can say I didn't give her a proper farewell. Key Tech is sitting with his eyes closed in front of Dong I K's picture that Kun Se put up on the wall. Head bowed. Penitent. A bit comical but he doesn't care. He continues to solemnly pay his respects when, he hears a faint sound coming from above. He walks up the stairs and puts his ear on the steel door. He hears lively chatter on the other side. Someone's come to see the house. They speak German. The real estate agents were smarter than I thought. They somehow managed to sell the house to a family that just moved to Korea. It's dark and everyone is still asleep. Except Ki Taik who walks up to the kitchen and quietly crawls over to the refrigerator. He sees a family portrait hanging on the kitchen wall. A German family of four white teeth shining brightly through their broad smiles. There are more pictures on the refrigerator. One picture shows a Filipino maid with her arms around the family's kids. The parents both work and the kids are at school most of the day which should have made them ideal housemates for me. But unfortunately they have a live-in maid and I risk my life every night for the tiny window of opportunity I have to venture outside. Key Tech carefully opens the fridge and a cool shaft of light hits his face. Inside we see, tofu sausage Korean gochujang paste Japanese natto beans. Luckily Germans don't only eat German food. I thought I would have to eat sausage and beer for the rest of my life. Key Tech takes a little of each food and puts them in Kun Se's old plastic container when through his peripheral vision he sees, something moving in the garden. Key Tech nearly jumps out of his skin. He quickly turns only to realize. It was his own reflection in the living room window. He stares at the pale ghost for a long moment. Key Tech eats tofu in the dark corner. Above the long beard we see his dull soulless eyes. When you're in here you lose your sense of reality. Key Tech lies motionless on Kun Se's cot. His breathing is so faint that we almost can't tell he's alive. But today was a good day. I wrote this letter to you. Key Tech gets up and walks over to the light switches. Looking at his Morse code coverted letter he starts turning the switches on and off. As he sends his coded message to the outside world we very slowly. Take care son. Ki Wu runs as fast as he can through the alley chest bursting with excitement. His breath creates a trail of mist as he passes the lights of nearby semi-basement apartments. And out of breath Ki Wu runs into the apartment and immediately picks up a used piece of paper. He doesn't even bother to take his coat off. He sits at the kitchen table and starts writing furiously. As camera tracks in on his quickly moving hand, begins sentimental music. We move in on Ki Woo's sleeping face. He looks happy. Tightly held in his hand is the letter he just wrote. His eyelids flutter lightly. He must be dreaming. We hear Ki Woo's voice reading the letter. Father. Today I made a plan. We witness the moment when the viewing stone was first discovered. 
A pair of hands pick up the rock from a beautiful pristine stream. A long-term plan. Ki Wu walks up the hill of the wealthy neighborhood. He's older. Dressed in a nice suit and tie. I am going to make a lot of money. Ki Wu is at the mansion. The one that at different points belonged to the parks the German family and Namgung Hyunja. He walks up to the gate with a few real estate agents. First I'll need to go to college. Then I'll get a job and get married. But ultimately I want to get rich. A female real estate agent shows Ki Wu the garden. Ki Wu stands in the sunlight and looks up at the majestic trees. And when I get rich I will buy this house. As professional movers carry boxes into the house two people step into the living room, Ki Wu and Chung Suk. Outside the window we see a woman and a girl, Ki Wu's wife and daughter. Playing in the garden. Well pick a sunny day to move in. Everything has been unpacked and put in place. The movers leave and only Ki Wu and his family remain. They are enjoying the sun at the patio table. Ki Wu turns toward the house. Then all you have to do is walk up the stairs. He's looking at the kitchen. Late afternoon rays lean into it at a low angle. We hear footsteps coming from the basement stairs. Camera moves in and we see a faint glimpse of someone coming up the stairs. Ki Tech. Come out dad. Then at last, Ki Tech walks out into the bright garden. Buckets of sunlight wash away years of darkness. He hugs his family. An emotional reunion. As sentimental music swells into a climax. Cold. Windy. The sun is dropping fast. Ki Wu is on the mountain again looking through the telescope. He puts it down and looks into the distance. But I have a problem father, I have no idea how to get this letter to you. We see the park mansion far away. Surrounded by countless other mansions. Lights turn on and off across the neighborhood. It's as if the houses are trying to talk to us. Ki Wu's nose is bright red from the cold. His eyes brim with tears. Sharp wind cuts up his breath as soon as it mists in the air. As the wind continues to howl. Music plays. Bright but with an undertone of hopelessness. The end. 